Hoda Order. Welcome to the Public Accounts Committee on Monday the 11th of January 2021, our first hearing of 2021, and looking at a vitally important issue uh, around the procurement and of course the rollout of the vaccine. And the UK's had a tremendous achievement at getting vaccines uh, delivered and agreed um, in December and being already rolled out and uh, in, in, given to people. But there's a lot of challenges in how the uh, procurement took place, what will happen with the next rounds of procurement of these vaccines and in the future, and of course the logistics of the rollout. And I mean, it is a great triumph that as well as the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, which was approved, as I said, on the 2nd of December, um, the Ox Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine has since been approved um, since this report was the report from the National Audit Office, of which is using, we're using as our lead pad for today's session. Um, and we will, we've got another number of uh, deals signed for five different vaccines, which are expected to project, provide around 267 million doses uh, at an expected cost of around 2.9 million. So obviously we're the committee looking at value for money. We want to look at how this happened, what's worked well, what lessons there are for government and where there could possibly be improvements uh, for the future. So before we start, though, I do want to bring in Sir Simon Stevens. Sir Simon, we're at the height of a very, um, very difficult second wave of the pandemic. Everything everyone feared seems to be happening. Is there anything you'd like to say uh, before we go into the issue of vaccines? Well, thank you, Chair. And you're right. Obviously, we're going to spend this afternoon talking about the hope that vaccines represent. But in the meantime, we are facing an incredibly serious situation. The Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, has again underlined that this morning. We have more than 30,000 severely ill coronavirus patients in hospitals across England. That is up by 13,000 just since Christmas Day. In London, perhaps one in 30 people has the uh, coronavirus. Uh, in parts of London, it may be twice that number. And if you look across other regions of England, the issue is that coronavirus is once again on the rise. In Merseyside, for example, in just the last week, there has been a further 50% increase in the number of COVID hospitalizations. So this is a very serious moment for the country and for the National Health Service. And it's worth remembering that this affects all ages. A quarter of the COVID admissions to hospital right now are for people aged under 55. So this is something that we all have to take extremely seriously. Well, thank you, Sir Simon. And I think on behalf of the committee, if you could convey your thanks to the thousands of NHS staff and NHS contractors who are working so hard and under such pressure to support us all, um, I think we would like to, to pass on our enormous thanks to them. Uh, I'd like to introduce our witnesses formally. Thank, um, yeah, just can I say thank, thank you for that. But I think what my colleagues would say is the biggest thanks that the nurse in critical care, the uh, doctor in um, intensive care medicine, uh, the paramedic uh, responding to the night, the biggest thanks that individually and collectively we can do is actually to stay at home and not put ourselves and other people at risk through transmission. We now know how this virus spreads. And in many parts of the country, it is spreading out of control. Well, thank you very much, Sir Simon. I certainly know that in my part of North East London, one in 20 people um, have a coronavirus, so it's obviously a very serious matter. I'd like to formally introduce our witnesses. We've just heard, of course, from Sir Simon Stevens, who's the uh, Chief Executive of NHS ENI, NHS England. Uh, we also welcome, uh, as other Permanent Secretaries, Sir Chris Warmold, the Permanent Secretary at the Department of Health and Social Care, which is responsible for a lot of the strategy around the vaccine, and Sarah Mumby, the Permanent Secretary at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and that department's the department that's responsible overall for procurement of vaccines. Michael Brody, the uh, Chief Executive of Public Health England, of course, a key player in all of this. And Kate Bingham, the Chair of the Vaccine Task Force, although no longer Chair of the Vaccine Task Force, uh, but was appointed by the Prime Minister uh, in April to take on that role, which we'll be probing later on. Nick Elliott, uh, the senior responsible owner uh, for the Vaccine Task Force and Director General at the Department for Business, and Dr Emily Lawson, who we're very pleased to see, who's the Chief Commercial Officer for NHS England and NHS Improvement, and of course was the senior responsible owner for PPE procurement as well as for vaccines. So uh, a very busy woman, uh, Dr Lawson, so we look forward to hearing from you and I'm pleased to have you in front of us 
uh, today. Um, I wanted to start, if I could, uh, back to you, uh, Sir Simon, about uh, the um, the rollout of the vaccine and about how quickly it can realistically be rolled out. We've had a lot of optimistic messages from uh, ministers and others, and we have talked to the people on the ground in our own constituencies and around the country who are dealing with this. Do you think that the time frame is realistic and what is your um, guesstimate or estimate for when, how fast do you think you can reach the key groups that are currently on the priority list? Yeah, and again, an enormous thank you to colleagues across the health service, but also our partners in the uh, army, uh, our partners in uh, Public Health England, uh, St John's Ambulance, the Royal Voluntary Service, uh, local authorities, all of whom are coming together in this huge team effort to mobilise for what will be the fastest vaccination rollout in our history. And this afternoon, uh, we have uh, published the uh, data for this past week, uh, which will now be updated on a daily basis. And I'm pleased to say that that shows another very significant acceleration in the number of vaccinations given last week. Uh, so over the first uh, three weeks of the programme, uh, as supply came online, uh, with the first of the vaccinations from Pfizer, uh, we were able to uh, administer uh, around 1.1 uh, 1 million uh, doses across the country. Uh, we doubled that this past week. So the uh, rate of vaccination has, the speed of vaccination has tripled over the course of the last week uh, with um, another uh, 1.2 million uh, jabs having been given. And that means that the total number of jabs for England uh, has now reached uh, 2.3 million and for the uh, United Kingdom uh, is over two and a half million. So uh, I think that augurs well for the further acceleration that we're going to see in the coming weeks as we head towards the mid-February goal of having offered vaccination to everybody aged 70 and over, as well as people in care homes, the clinically extremely vulnerable, and the health and social care staff looking after them. Okay, but the target uh, between for a, in the next month, between now and mid-February, is around 13 million. And we've done two and a half, which is an achievement. That's not, I wouldn't undercry, decry that achievement. But there's a, you know, there's still a lot to do. How, can you just give us some examples of how yeah. you're actually getting that logistical exercise going on the ground? Because the evidence that we've had uh, from GPs, among others, is that they're confused about the communication, and have no certainty about the delivery of the vaccine and that's the time to, you know, the timing of it is very critical so can you give them and us some reassurance that the logistical supply chain is being smoothed and will deliver because it's a very big task ahead uh, yes and you're right it is a huge task and as i say i think the, the proof of the ramp up is in the uh, over a million extra vaccinations that have been delivered over the last week and there will be more uh, this coming week and if the question behind the question is how is that happening, uh, it is happening as a consequence of three things. First of all, uh, supply uh, becoming available to us on a phased basis. It was only last week, of course, uh, that uh, we were able to start using the new AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine alongside the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And I have to say the Vaccine Task Force Bay has done a fantastic job in sourcing vaccine for this country, for the National Health Service that we can administer. So the first is, increasing supply. The second is increasing the number of places then that we are able to administer a vaccination. And you've seen a steady expansion in the number of the local vaccination services, the hospital hubs, and now today the wider scale vaccination centers and an additional option uh, coming online. Uh, and the vaccination plan that the government are publishing uh, later this afternoon will set all of that out. And then the third piece of it is as we've got more supply, more places, then we will also have more people doing vaccinating. And we've had a fantastic response to uh, people currently in the service, but also those uh, willing to volunteer to come back and help, uh, such that we don't think workforce is going to be a constraint on vaccine administration uh, between now and mid-February. But I would just say, Chair, that this is, if you like, in three phases. This is a sprint to mid-February. And then it will be a sprint from mid-February through to uh, the end of April uh, to extend the vaccination to the rest of the higher risk groups identified by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Information. And then it will be a marathon uh, from uh, April uh, through the summer uh, into the autumn as uh, the Secretary of uh, State for 
Health and Social Care said, where we're offering everybody in the country who wants it over the age of 18 uh, for whom the vaccines are uh, authorised uh, that jab. So uh, we've got what we yep. need to do in the next okay. five weeks. Yep. We've got what we need to do so fair we've got to that. April. Then so, March. so what what do you need from the rest of the system to make sure that the NHS is able to meet these hugely stretching targets, given that the virus, as you say, we know is rampant right now, that it's running through that we probably won't be rid of it by the end of the year. And can you realistically guarantee with, the, you know, with those the, with what you need in place that you will be able to roll this out to all over 18s by the end of 2021? That is absolutely the uh, goal that we have, and we think it is a feasible goal. Obviously, it depends on uh, continuing uh, vaccine supply throughout the course of the calendar year. But as the NAO report lays out, uh, vaccine staff have also done a fantastic job of sourcing uh, millions of doses, tens of millions of doses, hundreds of millions of doses uh, over the course of this calendar year. There may be some you know, uncertainty as to exactly which week or which month some of them arrive, but in aggregate, uh, we ought to be well served for the amount of vaccines available in this country over the course of 2021. Okay, so you're confident that by the end of this year, we will see that, that target reach, just in simple terms, yes? The, the offer. I mean, obviously, this is a. It's oh, a, sorry. A the offer. Yes. Program. The we offer. Think we can't force people to take them, but yeah. the offer. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to. Um, and just yes. in terms of prioritisation, um, obviously, the, there's a very clear prioritisation of people on clinical need first. I think we understand that. But uh, in, interestingly, there's been some discussion about changing that prioritisation. And uh, our, Dr. Whitty was on, on air today saying that there might need to be a discussion once you've gone through those most vulnerable groups about prioritising people, for example, at the front line of certain key services, in education, maybe in transport, in uh, supermarkets, whatever. Um, are you involved in those discussions and have you got any thoughts you'd like to share about that before we move on uh, to Jane Sherrill? Well, as you perhaps imply, Chair, those are um, decisions uh, that are for ministers on the advice of the Independent uh, Expert Committee, the JCVI, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. Uh, they've set out very clearly their uh, logic for the first uh, one to nine uh, priority groups. Um, but I think there is a strong case, particularly in respect of teachers and other key workers, uh, once the first high priority groups have been vaccinated uh, for asking JCVI to consider specifically uh, those uh, those groups. Okay, and can I just ask, we, we, obviously we're going to a little bit more in detail later about the gap between the jabs, but there's a first and the second jab. Of the two and a half million that have been issued so far that's been announced uh, with great fanfare today, and you know, good, good on it so far, but is that all first jabs and how many of those, or how many of those are second jabs? Uh, the vast majority of those are first jabs, uh, 1.96 million, um, but uh, there were uh, and some second jabs uh, where that was a clinical decision to do so, given that uh, last week was obviously just a few days after the uh, changed advice from the um, JCBI uh, and okay, the chief medical officer. Just over half a million are our second jabs. Okay. And can I just say... Uh, just... Uh, no, less, less. I think uh, for, for England, it's more like... Uh, uh, for England, it's 374,613. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. I've missed. Uh, oh, wait. And then just, um, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to bring in Dame Cheryl. Dame Cheryl. Sorry. Before you do, Chair, could I, could I come in on the prioritisation question? Chris. Which is, of course, as Simon said, a, a question for uh, government. And as he rightly says, there are decisions to be taken uh, on that subject when we get to the end of the JCVI uh, prioritisation list. Uh, it's important to note that um, there's that there were some things about the vaccine that we need to know before some of those decisions are taken or need to know more about. Uh, in particular, and uh, Professor Whitty's discussed both of uh, these, uh, we need to know more about the extent to which the vaccines stop the transmission of the virus as well as stop people getting uh, uh, sick. Uh, and we need to know more about how long the protection of the uh, uh, that, that the vaccine uh, gives you. So um, uh, not only do we have decisions to take, but there's actually more data that we need to build up uh, in order to inform uh, those decisions. And obviously the government will take those decisions at the uh, appropriate moment. Thank you, Sir Chris. Do you know what the timetable for that is? Because it is pretty critical and there's evidence that people who have been vaccinated are getting tested positive. So, um, you know, so small numbers. Do you know what the timetable is? Can you? Um, well, the, 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 this is being studied all the time, and obviously, the more we use the vaccines, the more we learn about them via the uh, uh, surveillance systems that uh, 
uh, that we have. So there isn't a cutoff uh, 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 date, but we will learn more and more. And uh, and when we uh, 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 when 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 we are clear that the initial plan, um, and I think the government has actually just published uh, its uh, written version of the uh, vaccines uh, uh, rollout uh, uh, plan, uh, we'll be taking decisions at that point. But I couldn't put a date on it uh, uh, right now. Yeah, I, I should just to, to let people know that that has been published, but obviously while we were just going on uh, into the committee meeting, so we have not as a committee read that. So. Yeah. I'm now going to go to Dame Cheryl Gillen. Dame Cheryl, over to you. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, so, Simon, just a, um, a couple of questions that are concerning people at the top of this session, if you wouldn't mind. Um, first of all, very well, alarming report to read that um, a person called on a house, charged money and gave what amounted to, in fact, we hope a harmless um, injection to somebody. But that was a false um, a false matter, but also surrounding the security of the vaccines themselves. Um, are you satisfied that you have got suitable security arrangements in place um, so that we won't see a repeat of that uh, terrible incident with the individual and that all the supplies of vaccines are secure? So maybe, Dan Cheryl, I could take that in the two parts that you set out. Um, in terms of the uh, second part of the question, the security of the supply chain, uh, yes, I think uh, colleagues in Public Health England and uh, Dr. Emily Lawson may want to come in on this as well, uh, do have um, reasonable assurance uh, on that point. There is a trade-off here between the transparency that everybody wants to see about uh, where vaccines are stored, how they move around the country, when an individual new location is coming online and so forth, uh, versus the opportunity that then presents to malign actors uh, in respect of uh, supply. So look, those are legitimate concerns that have been discussed, obviously, with the uh, police and the security services. Emily may want to come in on that. On the first point, uh, you're, you're quite right that there needs to be great vigilance on this. This is ultimately a matter for uh, the police and the Home Office, and it may be that uh, Chris uh, Wormold also wants to uh, comment on that. But I don't know if Emily wants to talk on the security of the supply chain without inadvertently therefore revealing too much about the way in which we're securing the supply chain. Dr Lawson. Um, thank you, Chair. So, yes, the security of the entire supply chain has been very much on the minds both of the, the vaccine task force to start off with and obviously the deployment programme now. So there is a um, cross supply chain security support um, comprised of the agencies that you would expect to be involved um, that is led out of the Home Office. Um, and that reports into the deployment team. So at our deployment board um, in all of the programme meetings we have every Every morning looking at operations and providing advice on that basis so um, has looked at security of individual sites is obviously looking at the security of the transport of the vaccine and is one of the reasons why some of that information you know hasn't been shared hasn't been televised for example um, it's also the reason why there have been checks on um, people who volunteer into the program to make sure people are volunteering on the right basis and that, um, that that we can assure ourselves of or the sites involved can assure themselves of the people who are arriving um, and we do get um, there are weekly briefings on that um, from the services to make sure we're aware of any um, of any threats in particular wanting to um, secure vials etc to, to um, for the kind of reasons that you outlined so it's very much on the mind of the program and something that we look at every day thank you very much Dame Cheryl I'm sorry, Michael, Michael Brady, Brady would like to reply. Brady. Only to say from the central storage, uh, from a PHA perspective, we've had uh, audits from the uh, CPNI, the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure, and from the National Cyber Security Centre. They've looked at both the, the physical infrastructure and the security, and also uh, the technology as well, and we've implemented all of the recommendations uh, from those two organisations. Well, that's good to know, because I think it is necessary to reassure the public that we're not being secretive about the supplies of vaccine, but this is about a matter of national security and that there are um, malign actors, as Sir Simon said. The other um, points I have, Sir Simon, are, are on matters that have been raised with me and I think are of concern to people around the country. Um, first of all, a lot of people have been getting letters, sending them to mass vaccination centres um, that are not close to where they live um, and they want to know 
know if they can go locally and the advice that is being given locally is to wait until your GP contacts you. Could you confirm that that is correct? And the other point is on the priority for the people receiving it. Um, I've had concerned constituents asking that they have a relative who is obviously young, but about to start cancer treatment or chemotherapy. And they're very concerned that they have not been called to have the vaccine um, and been allowed to jump the queue because of their age, because of the very strict guidelines that were set down. I wondered if you could address those two points for me. Uh, so, certainly, yes. Uh, so on the first point, the vaccination centres, the larger scale vaccination centres are simply an additional option that some people may choose to avail themselves of, but they will also be getting an offer, an invitation from their local GP services for a more convenient uh, vaccination if they would prefer that. So there's obviously been a discussion about how do we get the balance right between the scale efficiencies of running some of these larger operations that can do uh, many uh, hundreds of uh, vaccines uh, each day uh, versus the local convenience uh, that you need in order for uh, uh, maximum penetration, maximum uptake of the vaccine. And in a sense, we're, we're trying to do both. So we want to be completely clear that the letters that people are receiving and the text will uh, make sure it says this very, very clearly. This is an additional option, but if you if that's not convenient for you, uh, don't worry, you will get another offer uh, within the next five weeks uh, for a convenient local service. And by the way, if you're housebound, then we will arrange for somebody to come and give you the vaccination at home if that's required. Uh, and then on your uh, second point, then, Cheryl, I mean, again, I think we just essentially have to defer to the um, JCVI and the chief medical officers. They have they've looked at the point that uh, you raised. There is some flexibility uh, for exceptional individual uh, circumstances where clinicians can make that choice. But overall, their recommendation was that the uh, risk corresponds very greatly to age and therefore applying this age-based um, uh, determination was what we in the health service have been instructed to do. But should anybody in those situations, again, then contact their clinicians quite clearly um, and ask for advice directly? That is not the recommendation of the JCVI and the chief medical officers, um, no. So what do I tell them? Because they're asking me for advice and I'm not clinically trained. Uh well, I think we just have to say that uh, the uh, ask that has been made of the health service is to proceed uh, with the uh, vaccination priorities, calling people in, and we're doing that starting with the over 80s and care home residents and working our way, way down. And it is not currently the recommendation that people should be vaccinated out with of those uh, initial four groups between Simon, now and the 15th of February. Could you take that specific case away? for me because I don't think that's a satisfactory response for my constituent or anybody that is starting chemotherapy that is of a younger age group. I think it will cause a great deal of concern. Well, I think it's... And I'd very much like it if you take it away and see whether that could be changed. Well, I, I'm more than happy to raise the point directly with uh, Chris Whitty, absolutely. But as I say, ultimately, it is a set of clinical uh, decisions that are then the health services asked to give effect to. So it would be for, for the chief medical officers and for uh, the JCVI to decide whether to do something different than what they've currently told us to do. But I, I, I don't know if Chris will... I trust, to I trust you to take that away and come back to me personally. Uh, I, I should look forward Cheryl, to In, in the you. document that was published as, as we uh, started this committee meeting, there's some changes or, or clarifications of the prioritisation. So we may find that... Uh, Hi, yeah. that has taken uh, the questioning. I'm now going to turn to Thank Sir you. Jeffrey Clifton Brown. So, Sir Jeffrey, if you could unmute, please. So yes, you. now fine. Um, uh, uh, Happy New Year to all our witnesses. So, Simon, can I ask you one or two macro questions? Firstly, in the Prime Minister in his broadcast um, introducing the lockdown, so that if all went well, the, f the first four priority groups would be vaccinated by the middle of February. Is that still on course? Uh, yes, it is on course. And, and the aim is to have been able to offer everybody in those first four groups an appointment by the first by the 15th of February. Can I clear up 
the total number of people you expect to vaccinate because the report um, has different views on this. On one point, it says your department wants to vaccinate everybody. At another point, it says that we need to vaccinate 70% of the population. And at another point, it says we need to vaccinate 25 million people. Um, how many people do you intend to vaccinate uh, or offer the vaccination to? Uh, so within the first four priority groups in England, there are an estimated 12.2 million people. And so we aim to offer all 12.2 million people a vaccination before the 15th of February. How many of them choose to take up the offer will obviously reveal itself with each uh, successive uh, day and week. Um, the uh, central expectation is that uh, around three quarters of people uh, may do so, but we believe it could be higher given that in this year's uh, flu jab season, we've seen around 80% of people aged 65 and over choosing to accept the uh, flu jab. And that's up by about 10 percentage points on last year. So the point is there's enough vaccine uh, providing supply carriers on coming on stream as we expect it to. But if all 12.2 million people say yes, then we can jab all 12.2 million people. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, some don't, as of course in the real world is likely, uh, then that's vaccine that we can use for other people. And then, in respect of, yeah. sorry, and then in respect of the 25 million uh, number that uh, you referred to, Sir Jeffrey, which is mentioned in the NAO report, just to clarify, that's not now the number that we expect to be vaccinated during calendar year 2021. That is the um, estimated number of people who are in the uh, full JCVI uh, risk pyramid uh, categories one through nine. Uh, in other words, um, everybody aged 50 and above, as well as the clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, so we would aim to be able to offer that group uh, by uh, spring, late spring, uh, assuming vaccine supply carries on. And then uh, all the rest of the country, the other 17.7 .7 million adults in England uh, during the balance of the year. Does that, does that suggestion clarify it? It does. Thank you very much. Now, the, the rate of vaccination, um, again, you will have intelligence as to what this will depend, no doubt, on the supply of vaccines. The Prime Minister originally said that he wanted to vaccinate two million a week. Um, uh, uh, he now says that he hopes that we will have 13 million vaccinated by mid-February. Now, that's stepping up a bit from the two million a week. Um, uh, how long, uh, taking the previous answer, how long do you realistically think the sort of first category nine lot will take? And then how long do you realistically think that the vaccination programme will take through 21 to get all of those that really want the vaccination to be to be vaccinated? We've covered some of this already, but Sir Simon, just give a quick recap. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a, a very, very good question. So, as I said, I think we've got two sprints in a marathon. Uh, so, we've got a sprint now to the 15th of February for the first uh, uh, 12.2 million people. Being... I think so. Jeffrey has no having problems connecting before. So didn't... Yes, I'm sorry, Chair. If you've covered it, don't worry. <laughs> okay. So, it was, it, was, it was some of the other. Points. Okay, so, so the Health Secretary had said by the autumn, Matt Hancock has said by the autumn, uh, we would have hoped to be able to offer everybody in the country a vaccine who would want one. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Holden, MP. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chair. And um, one of the things that's concerning my constituents, and I'm sure in other parts of the country, is this localised data. Will we be getting localised breakdowns of data onto how many vaccines are going out, Sir Simon? Yes, we will. When? Well, and, and, and how localised will they be? Will it be on CCG basis, county basis, constituency basis? Can you tell us any more? Sure. Um, so we will do a regional split, we will do a split by the um, uh, STP ICS areas, uh, and then we're aiming to do a split at local authority level as well, if uh, we're able to do that from the data, and we're aiming to do that within the next week or 10 days, so people can see how their own uptake is going. And, the, it, and if I might just say, Richard, it is it underlines the important role that local authorities and indeed directors of public health are going to have uh, in the programme, not in... Um, calling people in because this is an invite program so we can do it on a phase basis but in helping ensure that when people do get that invitation uh, we see good uptake including in groups who might traditionally have had a lower vaccine willingness or uptake. 
I understand that. And um, so we've got the 13 million in the first uh, wave up to the middle of February and then 17 million in the second wave, roughly uh, nationwide. And um, are we expecting the speed of the second? You said mentioned two sprints. Are we expecting the speed of the second to be quicker than the first because we'll have higher uh, production by that point of the vaccine? Our aim is sort of, uh, you know, as those three phases um, unfold, to be able to uh, sort of each month, you know, vaccinate in line with the vaccines we've got that month. So uh, as we may come on to discuss, uh, the fantastic work that's been done to procure uh, vaccines, we should have a lot more uh, by spring than we have now, and we'll have more in the summer than we have in the spring. Uh, so yes, we would expect the uh, vaccination uh, rate to increase the supply increases, and in turn, therefore, to be using many more um, partners in doing that. So, you know, retail pharmacists uh, will and really so come into their own when we've got all of this vaccine supply that we can put in their hands. Okay, okay so we, we can expect those uh, national breakdowns from today of the vaccines, and then within the next week to 10 days, uh, localised data that we asked for, just to be clear on that point. Correct. Great. Correct. And Chair, sorry, did you want to, me to move uh, to allow uh, Sir Richard, just uh, Sir Simon, sorry, to... Uh, to change his speaker. The, next, the, next, the, the point that he needs to answer next, because then I think, Sasan, we've got some problems with your sound, which we're trying to sort out behind the scenes. Uh, right. it's told you Indeed. Indeed. Sorry, Chair. Um, just then. quickly, Emma, Sir Simon, on the treatment, and we've seen a huge up uh, dates in the treatment recently. I've had some questions locally about the use of vitamin C and vitamin D. Um, uh, alongside the other treatments, is that something that you're rolling out as well now? I believe that it was piloted at um, Newcastle Hospital. Yeah, let me let me get you a specific note, uh, uh, Mr. Holden, on the on the vitamin D question because that has periodically uh, cropped up. There are trials underway on it. Obviously, the new news this past week on treatments has been the repurposing of uh, two rheumatoid arthritis drugs that have cut the relative risk of death in intensive care by 24%, um, and um, no, has also shortened the we, we, we intensive care. Uh, so yeah, Simon, yeah. there is a problem with your sound. So if you could check, there's a back channel trying to contact you about that. Okay, shall I just shall I dial off and dial back in? Is that the? Yeah, that's uh, we'd rather discuss than discuss it on live air. But you, you, if you could just keep an eye on, on the back track, we're going to drop you off for a moment. I'm going back to Mr. Richard Holden and to continue. Yes. Uh, so if okay. I could ask, if I could ask um, Ms. Bingham, please, just around. This is just quickly. There's been a lot of questions in the press around the EU uh, and whether we were right to be part of that vaccine program. Um, I was just wondering. Um, uh, do we now know it was the right decision to definitely not be part of the EU programme? How quickly are we in advance compared to that EU programme? Where would we be in comparison? So um, we talked about it in our report, actually, that's published in December. Um, and the conditions that the EU uh, set to allow us to participate was with conditions we felt were not attractive, so that we were not mm -hmm. able to um join any decision making on which vaccines we had to abandon the um, negotiations we either had underway or were un, um, um, had concluded with AZ um, and we also were not able to talk to future potential vaccine companies that they may not be talking to currently but would do in the future so we felt the conditions were too tight and that we would actually uh, be able to act more quickly if we did it uh, independently. Equally, we remained very close and supportive and continued discussions throughout to, to help them with their decision making and anything else that we could do. So we just think, thought it was a better approach for us. And I think uh, in hindsight, that was the right decision because we were able to secure the vaccines quicker and we were able to start vaccinating more quickly. Indeed. And, and so on that terms of speed, then, um, how much quicker do you think it's going to be looking at the UK is going to get that rollout, particularly for those vulnerable groups compared to our uh, friends in the EU? So part of the reason for um, acting quickly was so that we could give the, t the NHS teams time to prepare, because we, of course, we didn't know which if any of these vaccines were going to work. And we did know that the mRNA vaccines have a highly complex, challenging supply chain with the, with the short stability and, and uh, minus 70 degree uh, cold chain. So the longer the teams have to prepare, the quicker they'll be able to roll out when the vaccine's available. And I think that's played out. And so if you look at the stats, you can see what's happened in France and Germany and Netherlands. Um, and I think our team has done phenomenally well. And the feedback I get from the mRNA companies is um, that they're highly organized, incredibly cooperative and supportive and have 
have formed an incredibly strong team. So I would absolutely like to call out my thanks for the amazing work done by um, Emily yep. and, and the team. Yeah. Well, we're going no, to that, I think we're going to that a little later on. So that's, that's uh, the whole just, one, just, just one final question on that. So would you say, Ms Bingham, we're well, a couple of months ahead of our European counterparts on this rollout programme then because we took a different approach? Probably. I don't have a de I, I'm not privy to the details now, but so I read the headlines like you do. But I do know we've certainly had plenty more time to prepare for it and therefore no, um, we should be doing it. Thank you very I mean, much. I mean, thank you very much indeed. And we all know that for every 250 injections, that's, you know, for, you know uh, really, uh, particularly for the elderly age group, is, is yep. really helping okay. protect uh, life. Uh, coming so to the main we're going to move on to the main session now. So, um, and exactly. um, so this is really looking using the NAO report, uh, thank you to them, uh, as a, a launch pad for our work, but obviously we're going to go a bit further as well. So I'm going to ask Richard Holden to take the floor once again. Mr Holden, M Richard Holden, uh, MP, could you... Could you thank you off? very much, Chair. So we're just now going to drill down um, a bit, uh, Ms Bingham, into the actual, the taxpayers' interest element of this, um, because there's a huge amount uh, of taxpayers' money has been spent here. Um, uh, looking about 2.9 billion on the vaccines themselves, and then a much larger amount actually on the vaccine rollout uh, program. And um, just wanting to ask, first of all, uh, really, um, we started obviously buying vaccines before knowing whether they were safe and effective. So, how on earth did you manage to decide which contracts you would go for and which would provide best value for money? So this. Thank you. So the starting point was to assemble a team of experts. So as yeah. I've said, I'm not I'm a therapeutic expert, not a vaccine expert. The distinction is whether people are actually have a disease or whether they're health, healthy. In the case of vaccines, we are vaccinating healthy people. So I pulled together a team of people who are both uh, clinical, preclinical, regulatory and manufacturing experts who could help both uh, triage the landscape of the different vaccine candidates and then perform the detailed work that we needed to actually assess um, the different characteristics of these different candidates. And the criteria we used um, were, uh, were they sufficiently advanced that would allow entry into the clinic in 2020 and if possible, approval in 2020. So our focus was very much to secure the most promising vaccines uh, for the earliest possible deployment in the UK. So the first was oh. about speed. Second is about the, the data itself that would support uh, its their ability to actually immunise and protect those who are most at risk. So that means these are vaccines that we needed to be convinced could work in the elderly. Um, and we also needed to be ensure we could could ensure that we could make them so that they could be scaled to the level that we could actually protect all those who need it um, uh, in the UK. So that those those were the criteria that we used um, uh, for for triaging the, the different vaccine candidates that were out there. And of course, we have relationships. So I've been in the industry 30 years and I think all but the. Uh, all the Western companies that we evaluated were companies where we had prior relationships in some way between one, at least one member of the team and those companies. So it meant that we were able to have meetings in evenings, Saturdays, weekends and move things forward very quickly because we had a level of understanding and trust, um, both with companies that we did end up securing contracts with, as well as ones obviously that we didn't. So it was, and if I take you back to May, which is when we started, there was no evidence that any of these vaccines would work. Indeed. And so the, yeah. the, the, our, our portfolio strategy was ones that we wanted to optimise the chances of success, that if any of these different formats would work, that we had access uh, to the most promising vaccine in that format. Mr. Holden. Okay, so, so it's uh, particularly around speed was the speed was the issue. And what premium were we paying on that speed then? Because uh, obviously we're looking at uh, we're looking at 270 million doses, give or take, uh, 2.9 billion pounds, roughly 10 pounds a dose. Um, what's the what's the price differential between the different uh, vaccines? Um, the, the mRNA vaccines are more expensive than the adeno vaccines, and the protein adjuvants and the whole inactivated viruses of vaccines are roughly in the middle. So um, the, the challenge is when we're negotiating, everyone is using the data that they've got at the time. And of course, none of these vaccine companies at that point had actually scaled up the manufacturing. And so they did not know at that point what their actual cost would be. So we, of course, struck deals so that we had firm pricing 
um, and in some cases options for, for, for further um, vaccines. But um, there was no, there could not have been a discussion about premium because nobody actually knew what the actual costs were going to be. Nick, I don't know if you want to pick up on any of that. Brilliant. No, that, that's exactly right. So um, we didn't pay premiums for early access because people didn't know what the cost was going to be. What we did was we negotiated quickly and early. We got into contracts early, so we had heads of terms set up initially and then into supply agreements. And we built confidence and trust with the suppliers that allowed us to pursue those negotiations at pace. Um, I think there is only one of our portfolio of vaccines where we did offer a slightly um, higher premium, a very small premium to get early access in 2020. But other than that, it's the position this case has just outlined. And I'll just okay. point out that we, we did secure uh, the first contract with Pfizer-BioNTech, which was the first vaccine to actually get regulatory approval in any Western country. And we did that because we were quick and we were nimble and we were clearly not the largest buyer. So the US and the European Union are much more substantial uh, buyers than uh, the UK. And yet we were bo both the first to secure the contract and the first to deploy. And quite frankly, I'm slightly astonished that you didn't have to pay a premium given that we aren't the largest uh, buyer out there and also um, that you know actually every month that goes by is billions of pounds to the economy so you know you're talking of uh, you know we'd have to pay this money anyway so getting the economy moving again there's, there's naturally a huge benefit in getting the supplies out early but moving on to the sort of the second point of this so we we, we, we know that you are acting basically going in blind but trying to negotiate the best you could possibly do. I mean, how did you determine the different doses, uh, the different dose numbers of the different ones, uh, Ms. Bingham? Because uh, it's because it's quite a wide variety. You know, seven million for the Moderna, up to a hundred million for AstraZeneca. Why did you go for those different uh, numbers? Of course. So the first thing we did was to talk to JCVI and ask them what numbers we should be using as our assumptions for the numbers of people who are vulnerable or those people that they were going to recommend for vaccination. So their advice to us um, right at the beginning was 30 million people with a target. Well, that's the groups one through nine that they've since uh, uh, discussed. So that was our benchmark number. In some cases, if they're two dose vaccines, then it's obviously twice as many, 60 million doses. Um, in the case of BioNTech, uh, we got as much as we could uh, for that early supply, and that's now 40 million uh, doses as opposed to 60, um, and that's phased. And the reason the Moderna number is lower is um, we could have got the full amount, but it's, again, the supply timing was going to be too late. So um, because they prioritised, in, in Moderna's case, they prioritised manufacturing in the US, because it's a US company ahead of Europe, um, their European supply wasn't going to come online for at least a quarter uh, after the time that US would come online. And then, so th that basically captures all of them except for the AZ. And actually the AZ number uh, assumes um, uh, vaccination of the full population. And this, I think that number was actually defined uh, before the VTF was formally um, set up. So that's basically for 50 million people. I suppose there's two questions, questions which follow on from that, Ms. Bingham, is given that we've now potentially got these 270, uh, 270 million-ish uh, doses, um, do we expect to then go back and be buying more from any of the other suppliers? Or do we think that these contracts are sufficient for what we need in the UK? So the, the, the number of doses... Particularly in terms of speed, obviously. Yeah, so the number of doses that are talked about in the NAO report actually only refer to the contracts that have been finally signed. We've actually yes. signed LOIs for two more. So we've actually got I 357 million doses. Yeah. Um, and that we've also got scope to um, increase, to have options on some of those. So the answer is, is we've got more doses than we're likely to need if they all work. And that's, of course, when we were signing the contracts, we didn't know whether or not that was going to be the case. Nick? Yeah, no, I can, I can understand that. And what are we going to do beyond, so with these extra doses, what happens? Do we, are we bound into contracts on these, which, we're, which we may now, now no longer need, or what are we going to do with the extra uh, supply chain there if we are managing to vaccinate more rapidly than others? Is that Nick? to Mr. Elliot? So, sorry, who's that to? Because Mr. Elliot was one. That's to Mr. Elliot, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Holden. So first of all, just a point of clarification, things move very fast in the vaccine task force world. So since case has been gone, we're now up actually up to 367 million doses because we secured another 10 million doses of the uh, of the Moderna vaccine. And the reason we went for those additional ones is because we managed to secure them at an earlier um, time than we thought we were going to be able to get them. So that is an, another contingency option for us early. Um, in terms of um, the overall um, uh, 
you know, what we do with those doses, it is too early to say because A, we don't actually know whether or not um, we're going to see um, the, the follow-on vaccines come through clinical trials and be successfully approved for use. And secondly, we've got to see what happens with the rollout as well, because there are always you know, potential challenges to what happens with the rollout. What we've tried to do, though, is make sure we've got as much flexibility in each of the contracts as possible to allow us to, you know, to, to, to not take those vaccines or to look at alternative disposal options. COVAX and the exchange mechanism in the international COVAX facility being one of the options that we have there. Can I add, oh, Chris, do you want to, can I just add one more thing? Briefly, Ms. Bingham, yes. Sure. So we also secured a deal with a Scottish company called Valneva, and this is a whole inactivated viral vaccine. And the reason, and this is only just, it's in the clinic now, but it will not be ready before the second half of next year. And the reason we did that, especially given the news about these um, mutations that we're seeing in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is by having a whole inactivated virus means you have a much broader real estate of, of viral proteins against which the immune system can then uh, generate antibodies and, and cellular responses. And so this, in, in many ways, ways for us, is a tried and tested proven vaccine platform with a much broader range of um, immune response. So it's unlikely that any uh, viral mutations would actually escape a whole inactivated virus. Um, and so that's why we've included that as part of our portfolio. Uh, uh, Ms Bingham, thank you very much for that. That brings me very, very neatly indeed onto my next question, which I'm going to direct to um, uh, um, Ms Munby, if I can, uh, Permanent Secretary at um, uh, Bayes. Um, so one of the implications of this um, is that we're going to be looking potentially at an annual vaccination programme. Is that something that we're now looking at in terms of this, um, uh, Ms Munby? Of course, we're absolutely thinking about the fact that annual vaccinations may be required. It's too early to say whether they will be or not. Um, we've got plenty of doses to be getting on with, um, not just for this year, um, but likely for next year as well. So it's we don't have a an urgent and critical question about annual vaccinations, just to be clear. And we will have the luxury uh, in that case of being able to take a little bit more time to survey the field. Um, what couldn't be done this time round, which is comparing a set of vaccines against a clear set of criteria, because information was shifting all of the time, um, that approach will be more applicable uh, to any future annual vaccination programme. And, and, and on that on, on that potential future program, as uh, Mumbi, what has been done to ensure future access to supply uh, to protect taxpayers uh, from potential price increases? Because I know at the moment everybody's this is very much a global pandemic. Everybody's throwing their weight uh, in shoulders to the wheel. Um, but what we're we doing to ensure that in the longer term uh, that you know taxpayers' money will be protected if we do end up down that route? Have we had those conversations with some of these companies already? I mean, ultimately, we would expect that our negotiating position will improve over time because more vaccines are coming on stream, more of vaccines are approved, there's more supply. So it's not a matter of locking ourselves in at the current price. It's actually taking the opportunity to renegotiate at the time at which annual vaccination becomes a certainty. And that's a really good point there, timing. What is the timing if we do need to look forward to annual vaccinations for uh, next year? What are we gonna be looking at? Uh, in, when do those decisions actually need to be made in terms of, from a, you know, from firstly, I suppose, from yourselves at Bayes, uh, from a taxpayer and uh, sort of production level? Well, not for a while, um, simply because we've got enough for the whole of this a, year. A while's quite general. No, no, indeed, uh, let, me, yeah. let me come on. Um, we've got enough for this year. If you also come back to that 367 million doses, let's assume all of those reached approval. We'd have more than enough to revaccinate everybody next year if we wanted to. Um, so we've got we've got time in hand um, here. So we are not okay. making an annual vaccination plan now because we don't know yeah. that one is necessary and we don't need to yet. But I can see Chris Wormald's got his hand up. To yes, and I was just wanting to dive over to the um, Permanent Secretary at the Department of Health. Um, yeah. Mr Wormald, do you want to add something to that? Yes, I mean, um, it, goes, it goes back to uh, some of the unknowns I was uh, uh, describing earlier as well. Uh, so what the future vaccination uh, scheme will be beyond the first round uh, depends on those things and also how the virus uh, develops. Because, uh, um, uh, as you know, we already have some uh, 
uh, uh, some variants. Uh, so um, uh, while we will be wanting to plan for the future, uh, we will want to do so when the right information is available on on, on all of those uh, uh, on all of those issues. No, indeed. Um, and so, Chris, um, on the right information, I mean, part of the problem with this is we've, seen that we've already seen this quite significant, several mutations, the South African variant, obviously the one which was identified in the UK. Uh, and um, as Ms. Uh, Bingham uh, hmm. men, uh, mentioned, you know, looking at this uh, wider uh, element of the vaccine, this one we're looking at for Scotland, uh, or has been produced uh, potentially in Scotland, what are, you know, we could be looking at having to do a vaccination programme for next year with an updated virus as we do with the annual flu jabs in a matter of months um, is that is this something which is under active planning at the moment well um yeah. I'll, I'll say various things about that and then kate will come in i was i, I was about <laughs> to say kate will be in a better position to answer some of those things uh one couple of things i will say i mean viruses mutate all viruses mutate we see yeah. this with flu every year now once you have got a base vaccine um uh, creating uh, alternative versions of that vaccine for new variants is considerably easier, as we do every year with flu. Uh, so once you've got a vaccine that you can adapt. And some of the technological advances and speed advances that have been made over COVID compared to uh, uh, how vaccines are normally developed, which takes you know, maybe five, sometimes 10 times longer than um, uh, has been managed uh, this time, uh, uh, ought to mean uh, that we can also uh, create um, uh, vaccines for new variants if those are necessary um, uh, at, uh, uh, at greater speed, but there's still a lag. Now, I suspect uh, where we will need to get to uh, is the same kind of uh, uh, global surveillance that is done on flu, where, as you know, uh, people identify flu strains in advance and on a world basis uh, change, uh, 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 change production, if that is the way this virus goes to. And I am stressing here the unknowns uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in this, because obviously it still remains a very new virus that we have a, a lot to learn about. But Kate, would you like to uh, add? Well, thank you, sir, Chris. I think um, what you've described as we need to make this as simple as an annual flu jab is exactly the strategy that we've taken um, taken on at the at, at the VTF. I've written about it in Nature actually because there are clearly things that we can do to do uh, to act more quickly next time and make this just much more routine um, as part of both surveillance and then production of vaccines. So some of the things we've put in place um, for the from the vaccine task force is to think about how can we improve the manufacturing, improve the scale up and fundamentally how can we improve the actual vaccine formats because at the moment they require needles, we have two doses, they require cold chains, they require healthcare um, professionals to administer none of those um, are ideal for vaccines if they need to be given repeatedly. So we need to actually be it, it developing vaccine formats which are ideally oral or buccal or intranasal um, or even a patch where um, you can just get it sent it in the post and that basically will then protect you for whatever period it uh, may be. Uh, Ms Bingham, you raise uh, again, you uh, uh, preempt my next sort of question and leave me neatly on to, uh, to go to uh, Ms Mumby and uh, Mr Elliot. Um, uh, to, to Ms Mumby, we're looking at, you know, the, obviously some of the payments we've made in advance uh, to these firms have been to help start manufacturing process and to support uh, clinical trials. Um, given the early investment in some of these uh, uh, from the government, why was it not possible to pursue uh, perhaps more on the intellectual property rights uh, as part of these negotiations? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let Nick uh, add to this because I'm sure uh, he'll want to talk about it, but it's fair to say um, that all of these vaccines have been developed for global use. Um, vaccine manufacturers have been talking to people across the world and the idea that we could have realistically acquired um, intellectual property rights over the vaccines um, was not seriously on the table. Of course, if it had been, uh, we would have been, uh, you know, open to having that discussion. But ultimately, the intellectual property here is probably owned in the right place, which is the people who are um, uh, designing and making the vaccines. And we need to be an outstanding um, buyer of those vaccines, both now and in the future. I understand. Uh, Mr. Elliot, do you want to add something on this point? 
Uh, not really. I think um, this mum has, has covered it uh, adequately. I think the, the only thing I would say is that um, it's only where clin clinical development has been funded that you'd have that option anyway, really, because the investment in manufacturing has been on the basis that it's been an upfront payment, but it's recovered through the cost of the vaccine that's coming back later anyway. So it's not something that you've actually given to those companies, you know, sort of to keep. It is something that's been recovered through the cost of the vaccine. I mean, we, but we have been putting some of this cash into the clinical development, though, haven't we? Uh, do you know to support the clinical development of the vaccine programme? Um, yeah, but that cost, again, is being recovered through the cost of the vaccine. So that is not a, a and that's only where we've been conducting trials in the UK. And it's therefore giving us the ability to gain access to those vaccines. So so we've got commercial arrangements in place for pretty much everything that gives us the, those costs back. OK, I'm going to hand over to Mr Bailey now, who's going to develop this theme uh, a little more. Um, Sean Bailey, MP. Go on, Bailey. Um, thank, you. thank you, Chair. Um, just, just, I mean, I just want to take a step back a minute in terms of the, actually what Mr Holden talked about in terms of upfront payments. I mean, you know, we, we've heard from National Audit Office that £914 million pounds of upfront payments were made for some of these vaccines. So I'm just conscious to develop a bit, just develop slightly a side theme here. How did we model the risk on these payments and maybe this is one for Ms Bingham because I'm conscious that uh, when we made these payments one would give us a full refund in the event that we achieve regulatory approval two required a partial refund in the event of non-regulatory approval of vaccines and two are non-refundable so I'm just conscious what is the risk to the taxpayer there? Um, the, the risk uh, was substantial for, for the upfront payment so in my appointment letter it was quite clear that the focus was to secure vaccines for the UK as soon as possible. And that would mean uh, taking uh, on costs for um, manufacturing at risk before we know whether or not those vaccines were safe and effective and approved by the regulators. So that if they were approved, we would then have uh, manufacturing processes and vaccines ready to start deployment quickly. So when I was on the actual vaccine expert advisory group, which predated the VTF, um, that was a question actually I asked the, the vaccine experts as to what is the likely likelihood of success of these vaccine candidates. And across the board, the, the feedback was vaccines that are actually already in the clinic probably have a maybe 15% chance of success, maybe 20%. And vaccines that are yet to go into the clinic, we should assume less than 10% uh, chance of success. So um, there's no doubt that we took on risk to actually to do the manufacturing scale up to um, for, for a range of different vaccines. And that's basically what the upfront costs are for. It was to allow those companies to invest in the manufacturing so that um, they would have uh, doses available should they be successful. Um, and that was a, an explicit strategy set up by the PM so that we could actually be quick to start deploying if any of these vaccines proved to be um, safe and effective. Okay, thanks, Ms. Binger. I mean, the, the one thing I would say there is obviously 20% and 10% are quite significant. Um, you know, there's, there's quite a high degree of risk there in terms of those figures that you've, you've just quoted. I mean, in terms of... of the existing risk that's still there because obviously not all of those vaccines you know we've, we've not had complete approval yet what is the outstanding risk currently to the uk taxpayer uh nick obviously do you want to answer that? Yeah, so mr bailey um when you look at the portfolio um if we had not made that investment then you would not have vaccines available at the point of regulatory approval and looking at the overall value for money business case of vaccines um, weighed against the cost of the pandemic. It only takes one of those vaccines to be successful to vastly recover you know, for the taxpayer the investment that's been made at risk. Actually, we're in the fortunate position now of having three of those portfolio of vaccines which have been approved for use, and hopefully we'll see some more as well. So I think it's it's the, almost the wrong question. The question has got to be, what is the, the success of the portfolio as a whole? Because that's um, the value for money criteria that was taken forward in terms of funding the programme. And I might add that of the seven vaccines we have, uh, three are approved, a further two are in final pivotal phase three trials. So Janssen and Novavax, um, I would hope will be releasing their um, phase three initial interim efficacy data uh, this quarter. And then the latter two, which is Valneva and GSK Sanofi will be, this, be the second half of the year. So I think the portfolio is, has, has developed just absolutely as well as we could have hoped. Um, and and the fact that we've had to pay up front is exactly, or at least a portion up front, is so that we can start deploying quickly. Mr. Bailey. 
I yeah, thank you. I mean, Chair, obviously, I completely appreciate and, and agree with the sentiment that obviously the, the availability of a vaccine is, is absolutely vital and obviously is a, is a benefit from taking this risk. But obviously, my question was more around the fact that, you know, in terms of raw figures, what is the taxpayer putting out? Because the, the purpose of our committee is to obviously look at value for money for the taxpayer. Now, notwithstanding that the value for money is in that vaccine, I'm just curious to know, as of right now on the books for that portfolio, what what are we still risking there? I don't disagree at all with the, the, the sentiment that actually the outcome of having those vaccines is absolutely um, a risk worth taking, but I'm just curious to understand what that risk is. There will always be risk in biological manufacturing because we are growing living mammalian cells and this is non-predictable. It's not like stamping out PPE equipment. This is highly complex, non-linear scale up, um, which is non-predictable precisely because of the nature of these processes. So we do have a phenomenal group of people working on it. Uh, and I think all that is, is generally working pretty well. But if I just nail your point about value for money, if we wanted the cheapest vaccines, we would have um, said we'd be happy to receive the vaccines in 2022. I have no idea how much cheaper they would be, but they would be cheaper because what we wanted was the most scarce resource, which is the vaccines that are available as soon as they came off the uh, production line in that in those early days. So um, it, it is a trade off to say what are the costs we're paying about £10 a dose. So, again, I don't think it's excessive um, and it's in line with the, the, what we pay for, for flu. Um, but uh, if we wanted to focus purely on price, which we did not, uh, then that would have uh, been at a cost of delivery date. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I just also want to look a little bit very briefly into priority access as well. Um, and maybe this is equally one for, for Ms. Mumby. So obviously we know that the, um, the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy has invested around 519 million in, in manufacturing capability. Do you think that is that investment is enough to ensure that the risks that we have over some of the priority access arrangements we've got. So for example, if, if the UK supply chain fails or if um, we can't meet those capacity, we can't, we can't access those vaccines. Do you think that um, that 590 million has, has, has sort of balanced off that risk? Uh, yes. So a couple of comments on manufacturing. Uh, first of all, it's I think important to say that in the main, manufacturing is the responsibility of the people who are supplying us uh, the vaccines and in most cases they're, be, they're large companies with pre-existing um, supply chains they're manufacturing they give to us um, the investments that we've made um, particularly in vmic and cgmic each of those investments has a significant capacity you'll see it described in the um, uh, vaccines task force report at the end of last year as up to 70 million doses in the first six months of operation for each of those facilities so uh, those come on stream uh, uh, second half of this year and end of this year. Um, that is a, a, a sufficient manufacturing capacity to manufacture all of the vaccines we might need in a year if we had to do that. So we have got kind of full contingency manufacturing uh, capacity within uh, UK uh, HMG owned uh, facilities. As it happens, uh, we're not currently using that uh, capacity. It's not on stream yet. And most of the manufacturing is being done uh, entirely through the auspices of the people that we've contracted with, and that's fine too. But as we look ahead to those uncertainties about mutation, about annual vaccination and so on, having built up that capability um, for the UK to be confident that we can do our own manufacturing if we need to is a really important legacy of this work. So Ms. Wood, just so I'm just so I'm I'm clear on what you're saying then, you are you're basically you are confident that the UK has enough of a supply chain there. To, to through the partly through the investment obviously that your department's put in to ensure that we can manufacture these vaccines going forward and in the event of a which you know in the event of an annual uh, vaccination drive that's needed we would be able to meet the demand that's there through the uk supply chain if it we just, wanted if we wanted to manufacture it in our own facilities which we might or might not depending on who we were buying it from we could Okay. It's probably worth noticing what we've done in VMIC and CGMIC is to put in state of the art bioprocessing equipment that is not fixed. So these are not fixed steel drums. These are flexible bioprocessing capabilities that allow us to manufacture different kinds of format. So we can manufacture viral based vectors, mRNA uh, vaccines, at protein adjuvant uh, vaccines, um, as well as antibodies. So the one things they can't 
manufacture are the whole inactivated viruses because that requires very specific containment facilities and that's what we do with Valneva in Scotland but at the other formats at least the formats that are that are currently active in in the vaccine space are all ones that we can manufacture will they need to be updated in due course as as formats develop of course but are, will we have state-of-the-art manufacturing um, once CGMIC and VMIC um, are up and running with the different, and including people like CPI up in Darlington, who provide very valuable lipid nanoparticle capability, that will actually provide the different the capability that we need to manufacture vaccines in the UK. Mr. Bailey. Okay. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I want to move on now, if I can, to indemnities um, and the indemnities that have been taken out in respect of, of the vaccines. And this is probably um, a, 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 this is a two-part question, really, actually, um, uh, probably from Ms. Bingham. And then also, I wanted to talk about some of the indemnity support that's had to have been offered um, for community pharmacies. So, in terms of the for the vaccinations, though, for these vaccines, the indemnities that have had to be entered in as part of the contractual process. Could you just talk me through again some of the risk modelling that was done around that, how that how that operated, and in a worst case scenario what would be the impact to the taxpayer? Um, I'm going to hand that over to Nick, actually, if that's OK. okay. Mr. Elliot. Mr. Elliot. Thank you. So I think you've got to start off from what the um, position of each of these suppliers was and that they were all seeking statutory protection of some form, um, just as has been given in the US with the PREP Act. Um, what we did was we took advice um, ac across from ministers and uh, from uh, uh, from all of the different departments, including health, as to what line we should take. And it was agreed that we should negotiate independently with each of those suppliers. But it was absolutely a red line for every manufacturer that they wanted some form of statutory um, protection, or if not, then some form of um, uh, of liability cover to to provide them with uh, with confidence that they could produce these these new vaccines. Um, we have got slightly different agreements and arrangements in place um, with regard to indemnities with each of the manufacturers, but on the whole, they are provided with fairly broad indemnities. And we've written to the the chair of the uh, of the committee with an outline of what those are. Those indemnities actually come into existence at the point in which the vaccines are given. Um, and so every time we start a vaccine programme with one of those vaccines, then um, we will lay before Parliament through the chair at the moment um, what the indemnity is. We have not been specific about that for a whole variety of reasons, and I'm not sure in this particular form I would want to go into the, no. the specific details of those, but they have been made uh, available to the committee. No, and, and, and uh, thank you, Mr. Elliot, and um, obviously we're grateful for that. I'm just, well, I, the point I suppose I'm really trying to get at, Chair, is when you know in the throes of the negotiation around these demnities was there any form of modeling done as to what may happen you know as you were taking that risk decision because ultimately it's going to be a risk-based decision as to enter into these indemnities as what that worst case scenario could be in terms of you know what would happen if it all went wrong basically and, and how was that done i'm just interested to understand a bit more about the process that was followed as, as you were negotiating these indemnities and you know i, I appreciate the explanation and, and that is understood but i'm just wondering how the, the risk modeling was done really so, so every, everything was modelled and the numbers that you will see in the information that's been ava made available to the committee includes the modelling, the worst case modelling that has been done. So what have you been provided with is the worst case position that you will you will get for each of those vaccines. OK, that's great. Thank you, Chair. It's probably worth pointing out, though, that if we didn't Briefly. offer indemnities, we would not be securing vaccines. So, I mean, it, this was something this wasn't a choice. If we either were going to agree some level of indemnity with the different vaccine suppliers, or we wouldn't be securing that that vaccine at all. Okay. And are you saying that, Ms. Bingham, because um, the indemnity cost would be so high that uh, the, the companies would have wanted to go through more rigorous testing before putting it on the market ordinarily? There's such enormous demand for the early vaccines that they had all the different vaccine companies had companies countries queuing up to do bilateral deals. And if we said we weren't prepared to offer a level of indemnity, they would have just gone to the next country on the list. And since we were mostly first, uh, they had a lot of other places to go to um, after us. Okay. Yeah, and if, if I could just add, I mean, as, um, actually, you may remember, Chair, um, this is not an unusual thing uh, for uh, governments uh, to do. We did we did it during um, the swine flu epidemic, and we understand that most countries around, or a lot of countries around the world, are doing the same in this. So it is a it, it, it's exceptional in that we only do it during emergencies, but during emergencies, it's something there is a precedent for. Yeah, and, and certainly we could get into a squirrel hole debate on this because sometimes it can also 
reduce the cost of something uh, relative to the risk of the indemnity. So it's slightly different perhaps in this situation. Um, Mr Bailey, anything else from you? Um, no, I'm done, Chair, thank you. Okay, and can we just check that those indemnities, they apply across all of the purchased vaccines, wherever they're deployed, whether that's uh, Crown dependencies uh, or to the devolved administrations, so that's the same, this just goes with the purchase. Yep. Not yes. Yep. Um, I'm going to hand now over to Olivia Blake, MP, over to you, Ms Blake. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I've got quite a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to ask some quite sharp questions, so I'd appreciate sharp answers. Um, the first question really is about the 12-week wait decision, um, and this is to Chris, uh, Sir Chris Wormwald, if that's okay, about why this, um, why this decision was made, and can you outline that? This is, the, this is the delay to the second dose that we the delay uh, to the second dose. In, 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 in introduced. Well, the very short answer uh, is we followed the advice of um, JCVI and uh, the uh, chief medical officers uh, that um, uh, the best public value in public health terms was to get the first dose to the maximum number of vulnerable people as quickly uh, as, uh, uh, as possible, as opposed to the alternative strategy of uh, giving second doses to the uh, same people. Uh, worth emphasizing uh, that the second dose is still very important. Um, it, uh, 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 the, the way Professor Witte describes this is um, the, the, the first dose gives you protection and the second dose gives you durability. Uh, but, the, uh, but the basic reason we uh, did it uh, was for the public health reasons, uh, as I say, set out by JBCI and Ms. the CMOs. Ms. Blake, back to you. Um, this decision was clearly taken before the full lockdown. Do you think that the decision could have been different and will it be reviewed at different stages throughout different lockdowns? Um, well, it, it, it wasn't explicitly linked uh, to the uh, uh, lockdown, but obviously the, uh, the faster the disease uh, is spreading, uh, the more important it is uh, to um, maximise the number of vulnerable people who had the first uh, uh, the first dose. Uh, we keep all these things constantly uh, under review as um, the um, as the evidence base uh, develops. Uh, but the basic maths of it's better to have a larger number of people uh, with um, uh, first dose protection than a much smaller number with uh, the double dose protection. Uh, yeah, we think that's a very strong argument. Uh, given given that. Um, do you think that this delay will automatically be considered for all the vaccines on your list? And will you be asking the producers to provide you with sufficient evidence given um, that? Well, it, it, it's directly driven by the evidence. Uh, so um, uh, I only know the details for um, uh, uh, the, uh, the vaccines that we are uh, using. It would depend upon... Uh, the data about individual vaccines and then the advice of JCVI and the CMOs uh, on what the best public health value is. So I don't think we can generalise about um, uh, uh, vaccines on this uh, uh, point. It has to be a data-driven and public health decision. Could I just add one to that? If you remember, the Oxford trial was a single dose uh, protocol originally. Mm -hmm. And then when they looked at their phase two, one of the arms had two doses, and then it was clear that um, the two doses did better. So then the people who had been vaccinated in the phase three trial were then asked to come back to, for their second dose. And that's why we haven't seen it yet, but the MHRA have got the data. That's why they have a spectrum of data showing um, what the immunogen immunogenicity looks like from four weeks through to 12 weeks. So actually, I think when that data is published, uh, there will be strong um, experimental data supporting that. We may not get that in other vaccine trials because most other vaccine trials have a very fixed uh, duration between doses. But it isn't. Uh, it is well understood that um, the the longer you spend between doses actually does improve uh, the immunogenicity. Um, so I, th I think it's I think it's of course the right thing to do from a public health perspective. But but I don't think you're going to get that same granular data that we've with other vaccines than we've seen with Oxford. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bingham. You've, you've undercut one of my questions, which my next question is, what support will you give to make sure that we're following up on this and making sure that that body of evidence is there for all the vaccines on the list? Um, and and do, you, do you feel that that should be something that we should invest in? 
So one thing we have invested in is the human challenge model. So basically what the way the trials have been run up until now have been in very traditional large uh, placebo controlled um, studies where you're basically comparing people who've been vaccinated against people who have not to show that those that the vaccination actually provides the protection. It's very difficult to do that, obviously, in countries where vaccines are being rolled out because precisely the people that you want to protect are now being vaccinated. So that the human challenge model is one where you actually take young, fit volunteers and you deliberately infect them to then start looking at the next generation vaccines in highly, highly controlled conditions. So you can start teasing out the mechanism of how the different vaccines work and you can start pulling out, for example, immune correlates of protection because you can test for example, the, the nasal epithelia and the immune uh, cells um, before infection as well as after infection in a controlled way, which you simply can't do in the large trials. Mm -hmm. So what we have been doing with the Department of Health, which has worked really well, has been put, doing some of these first ever uh, initiatives so that actually we will be uh, in an incredibly strong position to help support the development of next gen vaccines and to optimize the dosing protocols precisely to generate that data um, that you've uh, suggested. Yeah, and we also have, we will also have the data from the surveillance programs that we are running on the uh, uh, on the vaccine rollouts uh, overseen by uh, PHE and uh, MHRA. Okay, um, just a uh... So we're mulled up, it's okay. Would you know the date that that data is going to be in the public domain? Um, and how, I'm, I'm going to come on to confidence in a second, but um, how confident are you that um, given the, the approach, and I fully accept the approach, is to get as much out of the door as possible, how confident are you that you're going to have supplies enough for each of the second doses of each of the vaccines? Um, well, I mean, we've um, uh, covered the uh, supply position uh, in uh, uh, in, de in detail already, and um, uh, as uh, Sir Simon has already uh, set out, um, our delivery models are based on the availability of um, uh, uh, supply uh, covering both the first dose and then uh, the uh, uh, delayed uh, uh, second dose. So those are all built into the um, uh, uh, built into the uh, 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 models. Uh, and, I, can't, and I, the data? I, I can't give you an exact date uh, by um, uh, uh, which um, uh, particular bits of data uh, will uh, be available because I mean obviously a lot of this is research data as Kate has just um, uh, described yeah. but quoting, basically our data will get better all the time. But, but Sir Chris you're quoting data at us we haven't seen it when will that be available to the public in any form? whether the whole data set or, or, or a summary of it. You've given us well, some information today, but when are we going to see more detail? Yeah, well, I mean, we, um, the data we publish about um, the um, uh, vaccine programme should get more uh, uh, granular uh, over time. I think as Simon described uh, earlier, uh, we're going to daily publication uh, today, and, uh, and then uh, it'll become, as I say, more granular over time. And mm. then there will be um the uh, uh sorry to, sorry to interrupt do, do you yeah. think that it would be of international um imperative and, and kind of use to try and speed up that data um publishing um well, for the reasons that uk are doing things yeah we're, we're, we're hitting we're hitting a balance here obviously we want to make as much data as transparent as uh, uh, as possible uh, but it has to be robust um, and we have seen in other instances uh, in the pandemic uh, where we have been uh, uh, well, strongly criticised uh, for uh, uh, data publications uh, that did not um, uh, meet some people's statistical standards. Um, so in this case, uh, we are very, very keen to hit the right balance of, of course, getting as much out as quickly as possible, uh, but making sure that it meets uh, the uh, statistical standards that people also uh, uh, want to see. So it will be an evolving uh, uh, picture, uh, but uh, there will be more and more uh, granular data on the actual rollout, as Simon has described, and more and more of the research data uh, that uh, uh, Kate has been uh, uh, pointing towards uh, uh, over time. Uh, I can go away and look at whether we can say anything about the timing uh, of that. I don't have dates for you uh, at the uh, moment. I'll, 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 come back to the, I'll come back to the committee if there's something more specific I can say on the research data side. 
Thank you. Can and I just add on supply? So if you just take the three vaccines that have all been conditionally approved, that vaccinates uh, the entire UK adult population without any of the additional vaccines getting approved. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, I just want to ask about the likely, uh, Dr. Lawson, if that's okay, um, about the likelihood of turning up three months later um, and how you can counter in your communications. And I think uh, Sir Wormwald hinted at this about patients now thinking that one dose is sufficient and enough. Um, thank you for the question. So the um, we're, we're using a number of um, interventions to try and make sure people do return for their second dose. So for example, when um, we asked GPs and, and the primary care networks to switch from the two doses to single dose, we asked them to rebook the appointment, not just cancel it. Mm. Um, at the moment, that's a mixture and, and we need to support the PCNs in making sure that second appointment is booked in. And we indeed had a conversation with um, the CCGs last night about that to make sure that's in place. When you book an appointment at a vaccination center, you book two appointments at the same time. Um, so you book both your first dose mm -hmm. and second dose, so that appointment will be in there for you. And when we set people up at, at hospital hubs, we ask them to do the same thing. Um, of course, the vaccination event is recorded in your GP record. Um, so we can use the ability to interrogate the GP record to look at um, whether you've returned in time for your second dose and to follow up accordingly. So we're both trying to preempt it by making sure the vaccination is in there and then also make sure we've got the surveillance to, to follow up where that doesn't happen. Thank you. And another one for you, Dr. Lawson. Um, the absolute last resort guidance, um, and I'm, I'm using that phrase, uh, of sort of mix and matching. Um, what tests have there been of the efficacy of mixing two different vaccines? And would it be advisable um, to offer a third jab in this circumstances? And also, finally, on that point, would indemnity cover such a clinical choice? So I think it's worth clarifying. Um, I think you're referring to the paragraph in the green book that talks about if somebody shows up and you can't track what their first yes. was. Um, and so I'm thinking that that um, Mr. Brody may want to come in on that from the public health England perspective, um, having written, having his team having written the guidance. Um, I do think it's really important to emphasise that that's written as a lot. This is a it's it, we we don't expect this to happen. The only situation in which that would happen is somebody didn't have their first first dose in the UK at the moment, because we do have this ability to look back in the GP record to see which vaccine you receive, which would not only tell you what um, vaccine it was, but also which batch number, etc. So it's an extremely unlikely occurrence. Um, my understanding is there is a clinical trial um, being set up to look at whether that would indeed be um, be be a, be. A, efficacious but that's clinical data that needs to be examined and prepared so it's we don't have a program set up for that now because that isn't how the program set up the program is set up to give you the same dose at 12 the, the, yeah the same vaccine at 12 weeks that you had in in the first week can we just be clear dr lawson because there's been some some talk perhaps loose talk about mixing vaccines and the danger of that can you be absolutely categorical from what you said there is no like no plan to mix vaccines there just may be an occasional patient who's received a vaccine outside the nhs who then needs a set of yeah. uh, vaccination. Yes, I can answer this. Uh, to be clear, that, that, that is not the policy of the government. Um, and um, as uh, Emily has made clear, there is no data to support uh, that approach. Um, but, uh, as, as Emily has said, there are, ve there are some very, very exceptional circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think so. Just no there is no plan. Uh, but it is not the policy. And, and as I say, there's no data to support yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. that approach. So that just way. be clear. So, that what, that I'm just, so what I've said is absolutely, so no plan to mix vaccines on a routine basis. Just no. be clear. Just also, get that public health message out there, because I think there's been some confusion in the media. Dr. Lawson's yeah. nodding as well. Right. So, off Michael you. Brody, just yes yeah, to you. Just to say that's absolutely the public health England position as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Blade. Um, just um, to Sir Simon Stevens and to Michael Brody again, if that's okay, Mr. Brody. Um, what are the main risks of deploying each of the five different vaccines that have been purchased so far? So I, I'm happy to go first on this. So, so the biggest challenge um, is with the Pfizer vaccine, because obviously you're aware of the, the cold chain storage yeah. and has to kept at minus 70 degrees. So uh, we have ultra low temperature freezers in our, in our storage, in our, in our warehouse. Uh, and we have isothermic boxes uh, packed with dry ice, which we use while, while transporting. Uh, clearly, as your uh, our warehouse operatives are picking from those freezers, 
uh, we have to do that in a, in a structured way, which is why we've we've put in place the robust ordering process, which 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 uh, was reported on last week, but has a specific cutoff time, which gives us the certainty and the data and, and the um, and the consistency to allow us then to to through our supply chain partners uh, to pick the right number of batches uh, in a, in a safe and controlled way. So so with with Pfizer, uh, the big issue is around the uh, securing the cold chain. Yeah. Uh, with Oxford, it's uh, it's a two to minus eight degrees uh, for a product, much easier, much more like other vaccines. And, and bear in mind that we have uh, a track record of dealing with 17 different vaccination programs. Uh, we do in a normal year 300,000 deliveries a year. This is the kind of uh, expertise uh, that we that we already have. Uh, so you know, with, with all humility and not taking anything for granted, um, the risks with the the Oxford vaccine are, are much less. Okay, Ms. Blake. Did you and to... uh, what about the other three? I, and that's the kind of key here. Are we going to see any more difficulties from the other three, or are you confident that the Pfizer one's the most tricky? So, so Pfizer is the most tricky, but I'll defer to to, to the vaccines uh, task force around uh, the the specific characteristics of the other the other vaccines. Yeah. So, th thank you. So, so. Um, the, the Janssen vaccine is likely to be very similar to the AZ1 because it's also another adeno-based uh, vaccine. So that will be basically traditional vaccine cold chain uh, and should be manageable. Um, the Novavax vaccine, which is a protein-based, um, adjuvanted protein-based vaccine, again, is a well-understood um, vaccine format, which will, will be the same as um, Oxford. So it'll be a standard supply chain, cold chain, and I think will be manageable. So the, the, the tricky ones have been the mRNAs because they, these are very, very unstable bits of uh, mm. genetic material. Um, and then Valneva, again, will be should, will be standard um, supply chain, cold chain. So I think that we've, you've, we started with the most tricky and it's getting easier in terms of the characteristics of the vaccines. Can I say, Ms. Bingham, did, when you were looking at the vaccines, um, did you consider these issues when you were working out which ones to buy? Or was it obviously speed was a, a high priority? But was we did, we did consider, yeah, we did consider it, but but the question was, was it deployable? And I think if we'd felt it was completely not deployable, we wouldn't have progressed. Um, but the challenges obviously were the, the short stability. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, as the vaccines are developed, the stability actually increases. It's just you're limited in terms of knowing how long the shelf life is going to be because you're, you're, do, you're measuring it as you're developing the vaccines. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, we did consider it. And when we realized that actually it was a matter of uh, highly organized and complex planning, as well as having the right mi minus 70 degree fridges, then we felt that um, Emily Lawson and the team were um, could do it. So we didn't turn off anything. Um, because of difficulty of deployment, okay. but we did flag that it was going to be more expensive and difficult to deploy than a more mm -hmm. standard. Yeah. And I, I and I should add, Chair, um, uh, to, although we've run this program in two chunks uh, out of um, uh, with two accounting officers, uh, Kate and the vaccine task force have involved the delivery chain at all points in their systems, and likewise on our side of the house, we involve the vaccine task force in what. Uh, uh, what we do so both so 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 each strategy is informed by the other they haven't been done as two um two separate with a throw over the wall in the middle okay. oh, i might just come in We're here on to who's responsible properly uh, later Ms. i Bumby. might come in here if i may just to point out it, i think it's always worth remembering that at the beginning of this program we had very high levels of uncertainty mm -hmm. so when we started we did not know yeah whether any vaccine would work. And it was entirely possible that the only vaccines that might have worked would be the ones that required a very complex supply chain. So we gave DHSC a really tough ask because we said you need to be prepared for the most difficult, um, you know, as fast as possible, uh, because that might have been the only one we had. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, just, just going on, um, obviously, you want the same vaccines going to the same place so the second delivery can be the same thing um there's been some teething problems kind of reported anecdotally um you know of double the vaccines appearing at gp practices um and you know people expecting one type of vaccine and eventually getting the other and um, what what would you say about how are you tracking and making sure that you're going to get the right vaccine to the right place and what level of wastage have you had of the harder to keep one so far? 
if any. Uh, and that's to Professor Lawson, Dr. Lawson. Dr. Lawson. Um, thank you. Yes. So um any um arrival which which hasn't exactly hit the mark is of the mark is obviously a, a mistake that we then look into and figure out how we operationally improve and um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that 97.3% of the vaccine deliveries have been on time and in full. 98.15% mm -hmm. um, of all of the deliveries, because of course we've delivered over 100 million individual items as part of the vaccine deployment over the last six weeks. So it's, however, you know, the 2.7% the are still very troubling for the, for the people who are on the receiving end and obviously affect recipients. So every time something goes wrong, we obviously investigate you know, what exactly happened and how do we make sure it doesn't happen again. So one of the challenges we discussed last week was that the communications which were sent to each site, each PCN site, there were 1,380 mm. um, delivered last week of vaccine. Um, those letters were sent out at the end of the previous week, but some of them hadn't arrived um, before the vaccine because they've been held up in the communications chain. So we've now changed the communications chain. So it's not a chain, it's just a direct communication to the site. So we know when we press send that it's being received on the same day. So that's just one example. Um, the So the it's part of our ongoing operational improvement process to take that feedback and then figure out how we do better the next day or, or the next week. The other thing we've done, which I think came up right at the beginning of the conversation, is we've now sent out supply information to PCNs, not just for this week, but for next week, um, as of the end of day today, so that they can plan ahead. Now, what that also means is we will call some individual PCNs if additional supply becomes available and say, look, can you take some extra? Because actually we've got more next week than we thought we had. So it's a mixture of getting at least a base level of stability in there so people can plan ahead, but also, you know, respecting the fact that we want to get vaccines to arms as quickly as possible. So a bit of agility is definitely a good thing. OK, um, just going back to the kind of regionality of this. What oversight is there currently of local decision making um, around this programme? Do you feel confident that, uh, for example, 80 plus year olds are being done first and then, uh, you know, or is it being do done differently in different localities and um, how quickly they're moving through those lists? Because obviously uh, the populations are very different in different parts of the country. Um, they, uh, sorry, I assume that's to me, but I'm... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I will, I will, I, I inappropriately dived in, apologies. Um, so we are absolutely tracking that and age is is a relatively straightforward thing to track because obviously it's associated with your GP record. Um, so while there are always individual data quality issues as we evolve the pro program, certainly indicatively, we know we know how many over 80s are being, being vaccinated. Um, and so that the way that the supply was is allocated to the PCNs and, and we've now, sorry, primary care networks and we're adjusting that as we go along as well, is we looked at those with the largest number of over 80s to start off with and they were part of the um, first tranche and also were the ones we called last week, for example, where we had additional supply due to the relaxation of the two dose time mm -hmm. and also asked them to take additional supply last week. Um, what we are doing, not so much for this week, but, but for the end of the month, is to then make sure there is additional supply going to further PCN, have a very big cohort, not just cohorts one and two, but also cohorts three and four, as we move through the programme, because it's not evenly split across PCNs, as you say. So we're looking at basically their registered patient database and making sure they get sufficient supply to register the cohorts in, in roughly the right order, while also not holding up overall deployment, because equally we want to get all of the doses out every week. What's worth bearing in mind, of course, is the care home relationships as well. So every PCN is linked to a number of, of, of care homes and that needs a particular kind of deployment activity. So we're making mm -hmm. sure that the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, which makes that easier, has gone to every active PCN last week. They all got one box towards the end of last week and then they'll be sending more to make sure they've covered all of their care homes because that's not evenly split across the country either. Okay. And uh, finally, the, the last um, kind of question I have about regionality really is clearly um, how, are decision, how are decisions being taken um, to prioritise where uh, the kind of mass, to, um, mass vaccinating sites are? Is, it, is this driven by population or is it driven by uh, the number of cases? Um, how, are, how are those decisions being made and will those decisions be flexible and will we see any more than those 11 sites come online? Um, yes, so um, there are seven sites starting today, as you know, and then there'll be 10 next Monday. 
um, and then more before the end of the month. So um, the, as you haven't had a chance to read yet, but in the deployment strategy, it, it says we will have 50 by the end of the month. So that's those sites are all identified and, and um, working their way towards being ready. So the way we, we selected all of the sites, not just the mass vax, uh, the large scale vaccination centers, was to make sure there was as an even a spread of geography as we possibly could. So starting with the first 50 hospital hubs um, that started on the 8th of December, looking at the first set of um, primary care network sites, we started from a local basis, making sure there was coverage using the support of the military planners that we have who can put people put things very precisely on a map, look at coverage of population. We looked at it against deprivation index indexes as well to make sure we didn't inadvertently um, miss that particular angle. And you know, basic geography, um, looking at travel times and making sure that each PCN um, would be stood up over time, or if not, we had an alternative mode to deliver, for example, through community pharmacy, which will also stand up over the next couple of weeks. So the intent from the beginning has been to get to all of the cohorts as quickly and as safely as possible, recognizing we couldn't do everything in, in one big bang. So each tranche of sites has mm. spread across the country, recognizing that when you only stand up a certain number of sites in a week, it's spread across the country, but that still means there are individual areas that need further attention. So as we go through, we've explicitly tried to fill those gaps in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Blake. I'm now going to turn to Dame Cheryl Gillen, MP. Dame Cheryl, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to probe a bit more about the promises that are being made, um, because um, I've had the chance to skip read the vaccines delivery plan. And um, I'm, I'm still concerned about the logistics of whether we will be able to deliver on the promises that have been made. And as the government has been criticised for over-promising and under-delivering, I think these are really quite key. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, we, we know how, many, um, how much we've ordered of each vaccine, but there has not been a timetable for delivery of those vaccines at all. Um, and I wondered if you are satisfied that the manufacturers can, in fact, deliver the vaccines at a speed and to the places that can meet the government targets that they've already announced. Do you want me to I say think... that? Yes, uh, that'll be me... fine. Thanks. So, so the, way, the way we've worked with the companies, with each of them, is, is as part of diligence and part of contracting is to set out um, timing of supply contracts and timing of deliveries. And of course, we're doing that without in each case, any of those vaccines being fully scaled to their commercial scale and amount, it's because we're right at the front and we're right at the beginning. So what we do know is we are getting our um, share of the vaccines and we are absolutely getting the vaccines that are available, which we have um, for, the, for the UK, we are receiving. But but and the, but the challenge is getting is get is doing the scale up. Once so we're Ms. Bingham, you and I you, you and I come from um, you know a, a, a commercial or semi commercial background in your case. Um, I think you know I would expect to see a timetable. You know, actually time setting table. out setting yes, out the, a, the numbers. Yes, we have a timetable, but the timetable is based on the, the most um, available data that we've got, where we don't have these these production. Uh, manufacturing um, facilities at full scale. So the challenge is, is in the scale up. Once you're at the scale, then it's cranking a handle because then you've got the procedures and the processes and the quality sign offs and so on all in place. Uh, but but what's not there is is what actually are they going to be able to deliver versus what is what is expected to be able to deliver. And Nick, do you want to cover? Come in. We've got we have got detailed supply schedules right up until the end of February, and we're getting increasingly confident about the um, schedules for March as well at the moment. So these things crystallise and get more granular as we get closer to the delivery point, and we're working on a daily basis with each of the suppliers. So we are absolutely confident that supply will not be a constraint in achieving the February targets to vaccinate all priority one to four groups. And we're seeing confidence in, in supply thereafter as well to make sure that we can enhance and increase the, uh, the deployment. Well, can I just um, pick you up on that? You say all um, priority one to four groups, but um, I believe that you're working on the assumption that only 75% of the cohorts will in fact take up the vaccine or be in vaccinated. Terms of in terms of vaccine supply, um, 
then we are looking at the total 100% amount. So there will be enough vaccine supplies to meet 100%. Whether or but, not that is then taken up is a, is a different issue. Well, that's right. But the statement that is being made is in absolute numbers and saying it's the total of the cohorts. And that is not, in fact, in, in fact accurate because you are working on 75% of 100% of each cohort um, taking up that vaccine. Two, well, we two have different 147 issues, million doses of approved vaccine. So we've got 100 million doses of Oxford. We've got 40 million doses um, of BioNTech. Yeah. And actually, you've taken on another 10 of Moderna. So you've now got right. 17 million of Moderna. So we've got... We have, okay, but it's when, it's when those vaccines arrive, though, when those doses arrive. So from a supply perspective, we are looking at 100% of, of, of that um, clinical at need group. When it comes to deployment, how those vaccine doses are then deployed is a matter for Emily and the team to work out how that well, how that happens. That's my point. And therefore, it means that you have to be very careful about the language you use and the accuracy with which you portray this, because if 25 percent of each cohort does not take it up, then you are not going to fulfill the absolute numbers that politicians are then um, putting out to the public as being the numbers of people that are going to receive the vaccine. And this business of over promising and under delivering is really, really important. So I would like that to be taken away. Plus, of course, when I was reading, um, Skip reading this um, new report that just came out while we were on air, um, uh, there is obviously the issue over fill and finish. Um, I wondered if somebody would like to comment is exactly where we are on the fill and finish capacity, because I do understand that you have um, entered into the um, uh, the uh, arrangement with Wockhart uh, in North Wales in Wrexham. But is that fill and finish capacity, um, which is a potential bottleneck, as is acknowledged in this report, um, functioning at full pace? And is it no longer a bottleneck? Um, they, it is not a bottleneck and has never been a bottleneck. And I'm not sure what it says in the report because I've not read it. But that fill and finish capacity is um, is operating as we've contracted it to. OK, it says in the report, identifying limited global supply of fill and finish capacity as a potential bottleneck in the manufacturing process, the VTF actually entered into the agreement. So as far as we're concerned, there is no issue and no problem with the fill and finish uh, capacity in the UK. Well, the fill and fish capacity in the UK is just for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, and there is no that. issue with the Wockhart uh, fill and finish. We might also potentially use that for the Valneva vaccine, uh, sorry, for the um, uh, Novavax vaccine Novavax. That, um, that, that comes later. So we are looking at that as an option as well. Um, of you... course, fill and finish is globally constrained, and for some of the other vaccines, um, that are being produced and manufactured elsewhere, they could be potential issues, but we're working with the suppliers on each of those. OK, so we're not entirely out of the woods yet on fill and finish. Well, I, I think it's we are absolutely OK on fill and finish for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. For the Pfizer vaccine, they have got different issues in terms of their scale up, of which fill and finish is not a particular constraint, but there are other issues in terms of how they're manufacturing and getting to full scale. I think the issue is that with every single vaccine, these are new products with new facilities, sometimes new supply chains, and there are just you know, scale up issues, which you're getting the full visibility of, because normally these wouldn't be uh, shown because you wouldn't be getting the vaccines as quickly and as early as this. OK, and then can I just um, on on this particular sort of place and uh, and people, um, I read in the report that you've got 80,000 um, people that have volunteered on the vaccination um, program uh, to date. Are you sufficiently satisfied now that you have um, you can continue to identify and recruit staff? as the requirements um, continue to change? Uh, and is there any update on your future recruitment uh, to this programme? Shall I take that one, Chair? Sorry, Dr. Emily, yes, I <laughs> wasn't quite sure who to address it to. <laughs> okay, let, 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 me, let me start anyway. So yes, the, the response to um, the, the three um, national routes which are being used for um, volunteers and, and clinical staff to offer their um, support has been incredibly successful, I mean, much more so than we could ever have imagined. Um, and we we are now seeing the throughput through those pipelines, through the, through NHS professionals, through the Royal Volunteering Service, and um, through the St John Ambulance. And I think people may have noted that the St John Ambulance staff being deployed, for example, today in the vaccination centres. 
Um, there's also been very successful local recruitment, which you don't see so much about, but each system started recruiting back in November um, to or even October, sorry, to make sure that they could meet at least initial um, workforce levels themselves. And that's so a, a mix of those locally recruited staff who are at least partly, um, who are based locally is now being supplemented with that national level. And and we can see a way through um, into this scaled up capacity, which obviously we're bringing online in line with the supply that, that um, Mr. Elliott's just outlined. So workforce having been of, of real concern in the identified in the report, um, thanks to all of the efforts that have taken place both locally and nationally, is now really um, proceeding at pace and will be there for the for the scale up if it continues as we plan. Can I um, uh, just uh, finish my, my section, because um, much of it was covered before, by just saying that there is uh, this is a fantastic program. I mean, there is no doubt about it. And um, I'm, I'm second to none in my admiration for the people that are working on this and what they're doing. But there has been some bad publicity attached to it, not least um, people saying that they have expressed an interest in playing their part and they've had the bureaucracy that they've had to face um, or they've just been ignored. Can we make it very, very clear that everybody that has come forward um, to volunteer is not only appreciated, but that we do have so many volunteers um, that that uh, we are overcome with the generosity of people wanting to participate. I think this is really important because we are damaging what is actually one of the most phenomenal exercises um, that this country and the National Health Service has ever put in place. Um, and I would be, be very happy to hear a very solid statement like that, perhaps from Sir Simon. So Simon. I can't hear him at all. So, so Simon. I, no, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear can you. Now. Oh, right, okay, thank you. Well, I was just saying I agree with you completely, Dame Cheryl. I think it has been a fabulous response. As Emily and the report points out, there are over 80,000 people now who are uh, trained and ready to uh, administer vaccines. We've got the uh, St John's Ambulance, the Royal Voluntary Service and many others. Uh, as you also rightly say, uh, that uh, wonderful level of support, um, we will uh, want to be able to uh, respond and uh, help uh, people help us uh, as the year proceeds, but not all of those people are needed today or this week. And so finding the right way of uh, saying that, uh, as you so uh, articulately uh, put it, I think is, is crucial. Well, can I ask you, do you have a rebuttal unit um, in the NHS? Um, how rapid is that rebuttal unit? And don't you think it would be a good idea to put um, a better identified FAQs on the NHS website so that we can point people towards those FAQs? For example, I volunteered and I appear to have been ignored. Um, because I think that the communications part of this is also part of what is letting us down. Would you agree with that? And could you look into that as a potential answer to some of the issues? Uh, well, I certainly agree that uh, frequently asked questions on the website would make sense. And uh, yes, I'm sure we can do that uh, very, very quickly. I look forward to seeing that. Perhaps you'll send me the link. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you Dan, uh, by the end of today. By the end of today. Thank you. I'd rather, we'd rather they were accurate than, than rushed, I think. <laughs> yes, I, think I we agree. This one right. We know we just have to take some dictation from Dame Cheryl, and that's the text we're using, essentially. <laughs> Flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> yeah, well, you can, you can, I think you can rec change the recommendation of the report by that. I think you haven't know Dame Cheryl well enough. But can I just say, uh, uh, Sir Simon and to Dr. De Lawson, I thought a number of you will have an interest in this, but we're also getting this in evidence today and in conversations we've had locally and with colleagues around the house, confusion by GPs and others on the ground as well. So communication isn't just to the public. It's vital that people know exactly what they should be expecting and when, because it is those frontline health workers who will get the questions and if they can't answer them. And that brings me to one question that I've been asked is, are we doing all the over 80s first, pausing in areas like East London, which are young, and then waiting till we get to the 79 year olds and the over 70s generally, or is it going to be rolled out more smoothly across the, the area, uh, the, the country? Dr. Lawson, can you help with that? Yeah, so it, it's not a um, either or question, but, but an and question. So. Um, I think I mentioned earlier in, in answer um, to Olivia Blake's questions that um, we need to ensure that every PCN has had the chance to vaccinate, particularly the over 80s and their care home residents. Yes. Um, so where there are PCNs that have gone, you know, have managed to very successfully vaccinate all of their over 80s, and we have 
not enough supply to supply absolutely everybody with their full what they would like to do this week then we've said no it needs to go to those pcns who've got a, a much bigger group of over 80s for example to get through um however um as soon as we're at a you know a reasonable coverage i would expect to be able to have a conversation with the with the CMOs to say that we need to push as much vaccine out as we can, and obviously there's a trade off between ensuring complete equity, and the um, and the speed of overall deployment and making sure we get vaccines in arms. But what we can't do is have one part of the country running you know so far ahead of another that there's that there's real inequity there. So it's really a both and conversation rather than an either or. For those PCNs who have covered all of their over 80s, um, I would argue that they should be making sure that they're covering the care homes at the moment with the additional AstraZeneca vaccine that came in at the end of last week and possibly extending beyond their PCN. And that's going to be in some communication about care home coverage that we'll send out this week. So that well, it should be some number crunching, but there are some areas, I mean, if you compare say, uh, so Jeffrey's constituency with my own, we, were, we, we compare notes on, age profile massively different. I've got a large cohort, 30 to 35, and relatively few, uh, well, just a, less, just between five and 6,000 over 80, a uh, similar number between 70 and 74, for example. It's not, but the, the danger is we'll set up a system, get all the logistics in place, have all the volunteers helping, and then it stops for a bit, and it's very hard to get it up and running again. So are you bearing in mind the smooth uh, curve of, of distribution, as well as the obviously vital issue of making sure people in care homes and others are, are getting it quickly. We're, we're absolutely bearing in mind. We all obviously also have to act in concert with the JCBI guidance and make sure um, those priority cohorts are vaccinated um, as soon as possible across the country, particularly given um, the data that I think you would have seen on the deaths that can be prevented. So, you know, for one vaccinate for 20 vaccinations to care home, that's one death, for example. So it, it's as much as possible trying to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing, get to those critical cohorts as quickly as possible. And that's where places like the large vaccination centers and also community pharmacy can also help smooth um, the distribution within any particular locality as well. So it's looking across the whole health system to make sure we're using the right mix of delivery models for that particular population um, and all of the different communities that it represents. Thank you very much. Uh, Dame Cheryl wants to come back. Dame Cheryl? Could you unmute, please? Yeah, unmute. Um, I just wanted to ask Sir Simon about the coordination and communication with the CCGs particularly. Mm -hmm. um, I heard some anecdotal evidence that the CCGs were being asked not to give out information. Um, and I think I, I touched on um, the security side of vaccines um, right at the beginning of, the, of this session. But can you assure me that no CCGs are prevented from communicating with their, for example, local MPs um, about exactly what is going on? Because I would hate that to be one of those rumours that um, grew and grew like Topsy. Um, can you give me an assurance that the CCGs are able to communicate entirely and fully with their MPs on everything that is going on on the vaccination programmes in their areas? Yeah, no, I, I would certainly hope that's right. And as I say, we'll be making the local data available so that they are also able to track back what the uptake uh, looks like in their in their local areas. Okay, thank you. Okay, and are you and the sorry, and the quality control on on the responses you've been getting from CCGs? Are you finding there is a variation around the country, or are you finding? Um, in in the, the, the cooperation and the capability um, of all the CCGs uh, are matching each other or are there gaps? And if so, how are you going to plug those? Sure. I, I mean, I think it's, um, it's probably about a week, 10 days too early to satisfactorily answer that question because we've obviously seen this big increase in the amount of vaccination going on this past week and there'll be a further increase this coming week. So, you know, until everybody's had a chance to... Uh, uh, you know, really go hammer and tongs. It's probably unfair to uh, redraw too much into uh, any of the uh, differences that might initially appear. But um, we absolutely are going to be doing that. And we're going to be, uh, we've got mobile teams who are going around to help different services where we can see that we think they could uh, do more or do it differently. And as um, I was set out at the uh, press conference I did with the uh, Prime Minister uh, last Thursday, uh, we also have a mobile, uh, 21 uh, mobile army units uh, that are deployable under the command of uh, Brigadier Prosser of the 101st Logistics yeah, what, what, what Brigade. Uh, where we, we that will make a difference. Thank you very much, Susanna. Dame Cheryl? Yeah. 
Um, could, could you write to us when you reach that point where you've been able to assess the performances across the CCGs and to be able to um, tell us how you've addressed those gaps and how they've been plugged? Because I think that that is a very important um, area and it seems to me to be another weak spot um, in the whole logistics system that we need to have a look at. I can see Dr. Emily is nodding. <laughs> Yes, what I would say is it's not just principally CCGs, of course. I mean, this is groups of GP practices through their primary care networks. But in addition, right. there are the hubs. And in addition, there are these larger scale vaccination centres. So individuals have also got choices. Uh, it's not just about the local CCG. But I think, Sir Simon, so James Cheryl raises an important point because a number of MPs have been frustrated about getting information yeah. about local data with some sort of suggestion. It's difficult to pin down precisely, but that maybe they're not feeling they're not allowed to. So if you, that statement you've made is helpful, but if you can make sure that that is clear um, and MPs and local councillors and so on and, and local pop, the local, local people can know what's happening in their area, that'd be very helpful. And because I think, I think it's important to make this point, Chair, is if constituents come to us and we go to a CCG or a group of practices and they're not talking to us or telling us what's going on, we have nowhere to send those constituents except back to their GPs and back into the system, clogging it up. And that is a major problem. We've not got these clear lines of communications where we can quickly get accurate information to people. Um, and uh, as the chair says, I'm not the only one that's experienced this. I think we need to, to, to make sure those lines of communication are clear, if that's possible. Yes, and I mean, I think in addition, we are also doing uh, briefings directly for members of parliament on the vaccination programme and the public messaging is uh, you know, first and foremost, you will be contacted. This is not one of the programmes, you know, mm -hmm. unlike uh, the later stages of the seasonal flu vaccination where people themselves go and uh, maybe uh, present to the local uh, pharmacist, will you will be contacted. And that, that's the key point. Uh, we, will, we, the Simon, NHS, will be in touch with you. Sir Simon, everybody on this call and other MPs appreciate the national briefings, but what we need is local information. But I think we've agreed that, you're, that that's, that's allowed and you're sanctioning that and you're going to facilitate that. So that's fantastic. I'm now going to turn to Olivia Blake, MP. Ms Blake, back to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And my first question really is to uh, Sir Will Mulder, if, again, if that's OK. Uh, what are the key risks to the public confidence in the COVID-19 vaccines Very as good. you see them? The key risks to the what are the key risks to public confidence in the COVID-19 vaccines? Um, well, I mean, I think they're all the things that um, uh, to, we've been discussing in this uh, uh, this hearing. Uh, the uh, uh, the public, uh, as we've just been discussing, uh, wants clear messaging and uh, to understand uh, what is uh, going on. It wants to see uh, delivery uh, go to the uh, and deliver on the promises that the uh, uh, government uh, has made. Um, it clearly wants to be uh, uh, reassured uh, that uh, everything has been done uh, properly uh, in terms of the safety and the deployment uh, of the uh, vaccine. So I think actually this hearing has um, covered the uh, uh, covered the waterfront very well. I mean, I should say, I mean, it's not um, although it's di very different in scale. Um, these are issues, of course, that Simon and his colleagues at the NHS deal with every year uh, with every vaccination uh, program. Uh, and, um, uh, and the key risks are uh, 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 very similar. Uh, the big differences are the scale and the newness of the supply chain. Those are the things which are uh, uh, different from a normal vaccination uh, uh, program. One of our huge advantages uh, is that the NHS uh, it has uh, uh, run programmes like this very successfully for quite uh, quite some time. That is one of our uh, biggest advantages uh, in this programme. Okay. Um, do you feel more could be done to address some of these risks? Uh, for example, I know that the report references um, attitudinal studies that weren't able to be carried out ahead of the rollout. What what from uh, the Public uh, Health uh, uh, England? Uh, uh, yeah, I, mean, I do think uh, I mean, the communication conversation that uh, uh, Dame Cheryl and Sir Simon have just had um, is absolutely uh, crucial. The, the communication challenge is, of course, more difficult because uh, the situation is evolving uh, so uh, uh, so rapidly. Uh, and that does, of course, bring us a communication challenge. But I think the, the things they were talking about are uh, uh, extremely uh, important. I'll ask Michael Brodie to talk about the attitudinal work, uh, which uh, uh, PAG is um, very well advanced on. Mr Brodie. 
And thanks for the question, Ms. Blake. Um, we've undertaken a range of attitudinal surveys. So we've worked uh, under the NIHR program with Newcastle University and with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, and we do weekly YouGov polling as well. And the synthesis of all of that is that about two thirds of the population have said that they're very likely uh, to take on the vaccine and about 10% uh, say that they're very unlikely, the rest are a bit uncertain. Uh, and those that are uncertain or are unlikely um, the, the, as, as Sir Chris pointed out, uh, it's the efficacy, it's the safety, uh, but actually what we found from the flu vaccination programme, particularly for harder to reach communities, uh, is that it's around convenience, it's around location, it's around the booking system. And I think what you've heard from Dr Lawson and others today is uh, the robustness of that booking system now, that, that uh, people are getting their second appointment booked at the same time as the first appointment, the call and recall process is, is there. Um, it's We've uh, translated the, uh, a range of materials into 20 different languages uh, in Braille, in British Sign Language. Uh, we've produced 44 uh, different short videos to support people with information about, uh, about, the, about the virus, about the vaccination programme. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we've learned is that, that people trust their GPs, they trust lo uh, local faith groups, they trust community connectors. And, and that's where the directors of public health and local government have such a strong role to play. Uh, so working with our DPH colleagues will ensure that we uh, provide that sort of community cohesion, that community uh, approach to, to, to helping address inequalities, as well as getting the mass sort of volume out as well, so that we don't have parts of the community being left behind. So I hope that that demonstrates a, a robustness of approach that we've taken so far. No, th thank you for that answer. And um, just on communities, I think that there's a question about healthcare professionals taking it up themselves, but also learning disability and what support you're putting in place to make sure that that community is not left behind. Um, you've mentioned BME, so I don't need to ask that, but I really would like to understand a bit more about the invitation letters to the mass vaccination centres and whether they're counting as a vaccine offered. Um, or, or and could that skew indicators because uh, just to understand what counts as a vaccine being offered is it a phone call is it a letter is it a text message and um and how are you monitoring that really so on, I'll, I'll let um dr lost take the second part of the question um on the health inequalities issue and particularly for people with learning disabilities uh, we know from the work that we've we've done within phe that uh, i mean covid amplifies all inequalities and certainly so for people with learning disabilities uh, it's a really important question, and if, if, if I may, can I come back to the, the committee with a written note on anything that we're doing uh, specifically for, for the learning disability community? I'd appreciate that, thank you. Um, Dr Larson? Um, thank you. So the, the question about offering. Um, so we, as, um, as uh, I think Sir Simon, Sir Simon pointed out earlier, is, is we're giving people more than one um, channel, more than one chance um, to come forward for a vaccine. Um, so the, the letters went out, they included language that said you may also have already been invited by your GP, you know, it, it, it is up to you to choose which is the most convenient op opportunity for you. We did obviously pre-screen for people that didn't already have a vaccination record, but it may be that they had it in the in-between period, etc. So we're not limiting um, the, the channel that people can choose to go through. Once you've had the vaccination, that will obviously be recorded and we, and we wouldn't, um, the system wouldn't invite you again. Um, so that, that is an offer. Um, we are expecting to, given the criticality of this vaccine, to do a kind of, I um, don't know what the right phrase is, but to go back to people who haven't come because we won't know why they haven't come um, and to give them an, alter an additional opportunity to come forward, um, particularly via the, the National Booking Service, which is the easiest way for us to do that because it pulls immediately from the GP record. So people haven't had, haven't already arrived for a vaccine um, to send out another opportunity for them to do so um, to make sure we get to as many people as possible. Okay, um, just just going back over, Michael, uh, Mr. Brody, it would be really appreciated if you could specify um, actions around autism, but also um, those who are, are literate um, and those who also are without an immigration status in your response, if, unless you've got anything to add on those issues today in, in your response to us. Um, just on... That was just a nod, Mr. Brody, you're going to agree to that. Absolutely. Ms. Blake. Okay. Thank you. Um, just on, I'm trying to uh, kind of tease out um, why the flu vaccine take up levels are a good indicator and how you're going to monitor uptake um, and, and whether you think that you're ahead of what was expected um, 
at the moment. Uh, so Dr. Lawson. I can, I can maybe start on that one uh, uh, for you, Ms. Blake. Okay. I mean, the, the reason the flu vaccine uh, is an interesting indicator is um, obviously it's the same age group. Uh, and secondly, um, it has been happening at the time of the enhanced increased concern around uh, COVID in the older population. So um, it's the right group of people and it's happening at the right sort of several months ahead of the COVID vaccination. So that's why it's a it's a leading indicator, but it's no more than that. It's not determinative of uh, what the response will be. But I have to say that um, at this point, a few weeks into the programme, uh, frankly, we're seeing a very, very strong response from uh, people aged 80 and above. And in a way, that's completely unsurprising because this is the generation who were children when the health service came into creation in 1948, the generation that's lived through polio vaccination, through uh, tuberculosis, through uh, the advent of uh, meningitis, and many other vaccinations have come on stream, and uh, they have seen the benefit. So, frankly, I think, you know, what I'd be saying to my children is, learn the lessons from your grandparents. Uh, and the, my parents' generation are coming forward in very strong numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, just to touch on the IT infrastructure about the administrating of the um, the program, um, I understand that it's a one central kind of system, which hasn't necessarily been used in all the areas um, that we've got. Um, do, would you be able to give us more insight into whether you think that this system is robust enough, Dr. Lawson? Yes. And um, perhaps Cersei from might want to comment on that as well. I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so the um, the underlying um, record of whether you've had a, a vaccination goes into the National Immunisation Management Service, which is which is it's which pre-exists, and that information is then um, dropped into your GP record, um, which has one of two major software systems, um, and that means that that data is then available attached to your GP record with all the information. Um, which allows us obviously to track the second dose it also enables Michael's team to look at all of the the broader public health issues around it um, the data is available you know for people to do academic research you know spy is going to look at it etc so that is the, the backbone and I think that you're that you're referring to um, what we've put in place um, given the existing um, IT systems are different ways of the data going into NIMS so in, in hospitals they are either using NIMS directly or they're using NIBS which is essentially the same interface mm -hmm. Um, in uh, GP services, they're using something called Pinnacle, which is a pharmacy um, software provision, but it allows that direct drop of the recording of the event into the NIMS database. Um, and the, uh, the first MassVac sites are also using Pinnacle because that was the right thing to set up, but we will look into them using NIMS and NIBS as we go through um, for capacity reasons. So it's not um, as complicated as I think it, it might seem. And what's absolutely critical is we had to have that ability to know exactly you know, which vaccine you receive from which batch on which day in which place um, for pharmacovigilance reasons. So that's why that, that central backbone is so important and why every system we put in place has to talk to that system. Okay, um, can I just chip in there, Ms. Blake? Um, because um, I know from my local area that there's been some delays in updating the records to Pinnacle um, or through Pinnacle to the system to get that second uh, invite sent out and so on. Is that a glitch? Is that something that's, that's ha happening widely? Uh, and is that something you're on top of, Dr. Lawson? Um, so as part of our ongoing operational improvement, we're obviously looking at that, that data every day. Um, what we identified is that because um, GPs are, and their teams are innovating um, in how they're using Pinnacle, so they are splitting the tasks between multiple people in the surgery. Um, and so the load of inquiries on Pinnacle was much higher um, than expected when we stood up this additional capacity this week. So we might have nine different people um, basically all, all interrogating the Pinnacle system, if you like. And we hadn't, the, the, the team hadn't anticipated that. So Pinnacle over the weekend um, put an additional capacity into their servers and they'll do that again on Thursday. Um, but that is, you know, that, that's, so we've now identified that problem, we've put a fix in, I would imagine that as we go through, we'll find there'll then be another, a pinch point in it, and, and we'll need to innovate around that as well. So at the moment, it's we'll sort of go within, within some days or so, typically, once you, from what you've said. Yeah, we're going to increase the capacity, we're also going to look at, you know, to plan for the, for future robustness as we scale up, what alternatives would be available, how long would it take to put them in place to make sure we've got that. Sure, just to, uh, so if I can just. Just underline one sort of point sitting behind what Emily is saying. 
The design principle in this program was essentially to use the current well-tested local vaccination information systems rather than to try and do some separate vertical big bang IT project. So the systems that uh, Emily describes are the well-established systems that GPs and pharmacists and the rest of the NHS uh, uses for all sorts of other vaccination programs. Obviously, there are unique features here. The uh, volumes going through are high. Uh, there's a need to connect to the way the uh, larger scale vaccination services work for the national booking system. But this is not some new bespoke uh, IT program. This is essentially just uh, using the resilience and the experience that exists in a distributed way through well-tested information systems around the NHS. Thank you. Um, so yes, quite different to other, other approaches by government, I have to comment, but Ms Blake, back to you. Y yes, very different. Um, can I just ask um, about responsibilities and, and where it now lies? I think it was a bit clearer earlier on who was responsible for what, um, but if you could uh, outline who you think has ultimate responsibility for delivery and, and um, how we're taking, um, how we can make sure that everyone's accountable for the delivery of this. Yeah, sure, 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 shall I start? And I expect um, uh, Sarah Mumby will want to um, uh, uh, to uh, add. I mean, it's really quite simple. Uh, it's, uh, the Bayes side of the house and the vaccination task force uh, is responsible for uh, uh, purchasing, manufacturing and delivering to the health system. Uh, and then the health family um, is responsible for uh, delivery from there uh, into uh, uh, into people's arms. Um, so there's a very, very clear division of uh, uh, responsibilities and an accountable officer agreement between uh, uh, me and Sarah Mumby about, um, uh, about all that. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, it's um, while that's a very clear division of responsibility and um, uh, means that uh, everyone is focused on uh, uh, the things that uh, are in their competency field, it is very important uh, that each of those things is uh, informed by the other um, and therefore people from the health family side of the uh, house uh, are part of the governance and oversight uh, on the uh, 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 as part of the vaccines task force um, and likewise people from the vaccines task force are absolutely crucial to um, uh, informing the delivery decisions uh, that we make as part of our uh, governance uh, 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 structures uh, and uh, and it basically uh, uh, works uh, uh, works like that. Uh, and as I hope this um, hearing has um, demonstrated, um, has worked very effectively uh, so far. And uh, personally, I think it's one of the best examples of um, cross departmental uh, working to achieve a single goal that I have uh, uh, seen. But Sarah may want to uh, add. Uh, nothing to add, but for the sake of, of putting it on record, I agree completely with Chris. Thank you very much, Ms Mumby. Ms Blake? Um, just finally, um, just to, there's been some um, talk about batch testing, kind of holding up a supply of, of vaccines coming on online. Um, is, is that accurate? And should there be more being done to um, improve capacity at that batch testing stage of the process? So the way it works is that um, the, the MHRA does two things. The first thing is to assess the clinical efficacy and safety to make sure that the data all, from the phase three trials actually support the claims that these vaccines will actually protect um, the individuals who need it most and it's safe uh, for those people. The second thing is to make sure that every single dose of vaccine that is delivered is consistent and meets the quality standards that are defined uh, by the regulator, which is why we can't just ship in any old vaccine into the UK. Everything that goes into people has to be approved by the MHRA. Now, you can't do those batch testing uh, experiments until you've got the uh, final commercial batches to test. So these are things that are just, they are just sequential in how they're done. Everything that can be compressed that's been done ahead of time in terms of expecting uh, and predicting what, what resources and um, 
assays and reagents are going to be needed has been done but there's just there is you can't there are certain things you just can't compress for example there are sterility tests where you have these are time-based tests to ensure there are no nasties that are growing up in the uh, vaccines you can't compress those because that is just, just the straight time you can't you can sing to the cells you can do all sorts of things but you can't actually um, compress things further. So again, everything that can be compressed and shortcut through planning has been done. Um, but that, but we're not changing the fundamental bars of safety, which is ma completely mandatory that we um, uh, we make sure that the vaccines that we uh, then put into people are, are meet the quality standards and have been approved by the MHRA. So these are all things that if you sat in our steering committees, we've been talking about for weeks and months, and we knew that we've got these different hurdles we've got to get through. Um, and we've absolutely compressed what we can, but, but there is just a limit as to what can be done, given the, the pace at which this is being scaled up. Thank you. Ne Mr. Elliott, briefly. To... Yeah, I'd just like to put on record, we've, we've been working very closely with both the suppliers and the MHRA in the form of NIPS, which is their organisation, which does the testing. I'd just like to say they've been absolutely fantastic all the way through. So there's been no hold up from what the MHRA have had to do in terms of releasing batches. So, for example, all of the Pfizer batches were in this country by the 23rd of December, ahead of schedule, having passed all of their batch tests. And the same is happening now with the Oxford vaccine. So everything that can be done is being done. Okay, thank you. Ms Blake? Uh, that's everything from me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask, um, uh, well, was Bumby, I, I guess, um, probably Mr. maybe Dr Lawson, um, has there been any impact, or are you expecting any impact uh, because of Brexit on the supply chain of any of the vaccines that are not being manufactured in the UK? Dr yeah. Lawson? I think that one um, is for us uh, in the sense that they're, they're still with us at the point at which they come uh, over the seas. Um, and the answer is no. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, we've had very extensive multi-layer contingency plans uh, in place, including air freight if necessary. So it isn't, it isn't something that even if there had been significant delays at the border, um, we would have been worried about fundamentally disrupting the programme. And is it practical to air freight the Pfizer vaccine because of the cold storage? That's okay. That's it. Okay. So it's not. Yeah, not it's, it is okay. We managed to get all the Pfizer vaccine into the country at the height of the borders being closed because we had contingency plans in place. So as I said, you know, all Pfizer vaccine was in country by the 23rd of December, and that included transit over the period when the border was, um, you know, going through its uh, its issues. Right. Great. Well, that's that's heartening to to know. Um, and then I want to move on um, and to back to you, Ms. Mumby, about the the vaccine task force and why and why it was necessary to establish a vaccine task force. Was it that the, the system didn't have a system good enough in place? Well, what, what was the thinking behind setting up this particular task force? Well, uh, one second of history first. Um, so uh, in April, really quite soon after the whole thing kicked off, um, Sir Patrick Valance uh, brought together a group of experts to look at vaccines. We had people in the department who worked closely with our researchers um, working on it. There was activity happening across the system. What I think became quite quite clear quite fast is that this was a huge cross government at pace at scale effort. Um, and no, the government doesn't have a standing pandemic uh, vaccine function at the kind of scale of the VTF that exists all the time. That wouldn't be a good use of people or money um, to have that uh, wait you know, for decades for the moment to come along. The answer is to be able to build fast when you need it. Um, and so the VTF was created in order to give senior focus, the right governance, the right people um, to a really big uh, cross government problem. Okay. So was it part of pandemic planning? I mean, yeah, a decade ago, I remember just over that sitting on a pandemic a, a cabinet subcommittee dealing with then pandemic planning. So was it something that was in the plan to have a, a task force like this, bringing in to, bringing 200 people or so together to deliver? Or was it something you did on the hoof? I mean, I mean, I say on the hoof, that sounds pejorative. I mean, you had to do it quickly, but did you, did, was it something you, you thought of in the moment? Or did you uh, have, had you had any planning in, in the departments? I, don't, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I would say that at the time the decision was made, it wasn't a particularly um, difficult or tortured decision to create the VTF. Uh, we needed a function. We were able to set it up quickly and efficiently. So we did so. Okay. Yeah, um, I, 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 I can possibly help, Chair. Um, a long uh, so, time, Chris. Chris. <laughs> sorry? 
You've been around a long time. You have the history. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, it's a positive thing. The civil service moves on too fast most of the time. I've lost my career now. No, um, uh, to, uh, vaccines uh, have always been uh, part of the uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, plan. Of course, uh, as you know, the major planning uh, that was done was for a flu pandemic where there are pre-existing vaccines. Uh, so the question would be uh, uh, converting. Uh, here we were in the situation uh, where uh, we had a pandemic uh, for a disease class for which there has never been a vaccine. Uh, to, so it was a, uh, a rather different uh, uh, challenge. So there was lots of planning for uh, vaccines and vaccine deployment. Of course, as I said before, building on what the NHS uh, does anyway, uh, but there was a unique challenge here to which a unique uh, solution uh, was developed uh, at speed, but building on what was there already. So, for example, uh, the uh, the expertise that uh, the government has permanently in the purchase of vaccines uh, in PAG and uh, elsewhere was at the disposal of the uh, 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 of the task force. So it was new, but building on what was there uh, already. Can I, can I then um, and ask, um, well, I'll start with you, Sarah Mumby, but, but do deflect to other colleagues, uh, other permanent secretaries or also Simon, if, if, if necessary. Um, you've got this task force that's done a challenging job, bringing 200 people together, including people from outside Whitehall. So I think 79 of that 200 were from outside Whitehall. Um, how are you going to make sure that you're up to speed and getting, you know, continuing with the current vaccine programme, but also potentially having to procure new vaccines for different variants? Uh, and so on. I mean, is it going to become a standing part of, of business uh, of government now? Well, certainly for the moment, yes. So uh, currently the vaccines task force is still in existence. Um, it's still got over 200 people working in it. It's going at absolutely full pelt and we've got no plans to change that. Clearly, if in due course it became obvious that this problem had become much more straightforward, um, then you could find a different solution. You would certainly scale it down. Um, but I think this comes back to the uncertainty about what the future vaccine programme will look like, depending on progress of both the, of the virus and the technology. One of the interesting things about this, of course, is it brought together people from inside and outside Whitehall. And we know on this committee, we often talk about the skills in Whitehall. And you wouldn't have um, uh, people of uh, Dr. Bingham's experience sitting around in Whitehall as a civil servant, not doing this normally. But there are challenges when you bring people in from the private sector. One, keeping them standing when you need them. So how are you doing on holding in in private sector expertise first of all that you think you need and how you hold, how are you holding on to that or making sure that you've got access to it and um, to date we haven't had problems holding on to private sector talent i think because um this is an issue of you know absolute number one national priority and the best way to motivate and retain people is to give them something that really matters to okay. work on but then one of the challenges of course about having people come in from the private sector and then go back out to the private sector again with access to Whitehall is that there can be huge issues around conflicts of interest. And I'll come to, 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 to Ms. Bingham in a moment on, on, on some of the challenges that she's uh, faced in that respect. So how, you, how do you manage that as a permanent secretary? You were the accounting officer responsible for the expenditure, but the task, vaccines task force was really driving this through. So where did you fit in this and how do you make sure that when people leave, they're not um, making, basically making money out of their Whitehall knowledge that's not necessarily benefiting the private sector? It's a challenge that we've grappled with on this committee for some time. So how are you grappling with it now in real time, Ms. Mumbin? So I think there was a smaller question in that just before I get on to conflicts of interest and how that's managed, which is just about the fundamental accountability yes. structure here. And I Forgive think it's me, worth, up, worth saying for the record, the formal accountability runs very clearly through Nick to me. Um, so that, that, that's the setup here, that there isn't, a, there isn't a, a different structure. And all of the decisions that we've talked about, about what's value for money, what should be signed and so on, have gone through the standard departmental um, projects and investment committee that advises me, um, have gone through my sign off and have gone through ministerial sign off. So just to, to, to sort of uh, put to rest any concerns about the way the formal accountability works. Okay, but had there been a just, I mean, that's interesting you say that, because that's, that's yeah, as the report lays out, you know, we know that that's what officially happened. And I'll come to Ms. Bingham in a moment. I don't talk about you, Ms. Bingham, without talking with you, but uh, if I if you'll hold for a moment. But if there had been a disagreement between the chair of the vaccines task force at any point and the civil servant directly through the accountability line, how would you have managed that as a permanent secretary? I mean, in the same way I would manage a disagreement, say, between two of my DGs in the normal course of doing business. I'd look to understand what the issue was, talk to them, you know, attempt to reach a, 
a, a sensible, uh, balanced answer. But ultimately, the accountability and the decision making um, lies with me reporting up to the Secretary of State. Okay. So, Chris, in terms of the accountability, obviously, you've got a big part in this as well. Are you content with the accountability uh, processes and how do you make sure that conflicts of interest, which I need to come back to with Mumbi on, are not uh, are managed? Um, well, it's the same answer as um, uh, Sarah has uh, uh, just uh, given. Uh, we haven't changed um, the um, uh, accounting officer structure or the ministerial decision making structure uh, for uh, any of this other than, uh, as you know, adding an extra uh, accounting officer. Uh, who uh, comes to this committee quite a lot. Uh, but other than that, we have used exactly the same uh, structures that we uh, 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 normally uh, uh, do. And, um, and as Sarah says, you manage the conflicts uh, of interest in the same way as you would mani manage any uh, conflicts uh, of uh, 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 interest. Um, uh, the uh, uh, DHSC faces this challenge the entire time. We uh, 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 have, as you know, a very, very large drugs budget in the uh, normal course of events. Um, and we need expertise um, from the pharmaceutical sector and elsewhere um, in order to be able to uh, deal with uh, that and you manage any conflicts uh, that arise via the uh, standard uh, procedures. And I think, I mean, the general principle from what Sarah's uh, said is exactly right. Uh, the, okay. the important thing in these situations is you double down on the existing systems. Um, you do not create new ones. Okay. So, uh, can um, I just and and it's, that, yeah. it, it's creating that balance where the government can get it the advice that it needs um, while ensuring that uh, decisions are taken in the proper way by the proper people. Okay, well, Ms. Mumby, just going back to you on this conflict of interest, because 38 members of the task force registered as potential conflict. Um, can you tell me, was that split across uh, people who come through the civil service uh, and, and people from the private sector, or was it in one, was it more in the private sector? I imagine uh, it might be more in the private sector. The majority obviously. of those would have been um, uh, through, through colleagues brought in through the private sector. I think it's important to say that in a lot of those cases, the conflicts of interest that we're identifying are small that doesn't mean they don't need to be managed they absolutely do need to be managed but it might be something like you have a shareholding in a particular company you declare that um, and we ask you not to trade in that company um, uh, for the duration of the um, information being relevant it's not necessarily a kind of major uh, conflict of interest that goes to sort of the heart of your your role if it were then obviously you wouldn't be able to do that role so it actually our Business, of usual, business as usual conflicts of interest system, although it's needed to be scaled up to deal with the quantity of people coming in, not particularly because they've been more conflicted than usual, but just because there have been more of them coming in from the private sector. And the Vaccines Task Force has had some dedicated people focused purely on the question of conflict of interest, just to deal with that scale of flow. But the usual process that we use with making sure we examine, understand, and then take individualized mitigations on each person who declares a particular conflict of interest, I don't think we've had to change that. And I think it's, it's worked well. Can I just go, I'll turn to Nick Elliott and I'll come to, to you, Ms. Bingham. Um, how have you made sure in your role as the, the civil servant accountability line that people who've left the task force um, haven't, haven't managed, haven't done, hadn't any personal or professional profit that's inappropriate as a result of their work? And how, how, have you, how, can you, how are you policing that? So when they leave, there's a, a, a process that everybody goes through in terms of you know, making sure they're signing non-disclosure agreements making sure they understand what um, you know, they, they have signed up to over the time that they've been working for government so that they're very clear about it. Over and above that, I think it's quite difficult to you know, actively police it, but I think people are very clear about what their responsibilities are at the point in which they leave and we make sure that is done as part of the, um, you know, the, the uh, organisation and the discussion that happens when they leave the... Have, uh, have, you, have, have, have you had to put any people on gardening leave so that there's a kind of buffer between what they're doing with the vaccine program and Whitehall and what they go and do later? Uh, we haven't had that yet, but we haven't had a huge amount of people leave, um, no. other than Kate, who I'm sure we'll come on to in a minute. Then, um, you know, most people that we brought into the program are actually still working on the program. We haven't had a significant number of people leave uh, from the private sector at the moment, so it's not been an issue we've had to face yet. Okay. So, Ms Bingham, you've had a, a rocky ride. You've been criticised um, uh, for connections you've got, um, and yet what you're doing is quite a rarefied uh, area of work. Do you think when you got the call, did you from the Prime Minister, did you think you were the only person who could do this? Or, I mean, are there lots of people in your sphere who could have possibly been the chair of the Vaccines Task Force? 
Well, my, my reaction uh, when I first got the call was to say, uh, remind uh, them that I'm not a vaccines expert. My role over the last 30 years has been taking novel science and turning those into therapeutics. So those are drugs that are treating patients with actual diseases, as opposed to vaccines where you're um, prophylactically giving these people vaccines to healthy people. So there is a distinction in terms of business model and what the ultimate product is versus what I'm, what I'm used to. So are there other vaccine experts out there? Of course there are, but what I now realize um, is actually the venture capital skill set and the biotech mindset is exactly what was needed because what we need what I spend my life doing is basically surveying new uh, science and products and um, you know biological areas working out how you can actually evaluate those for in my case therapeutic intervention showing that they're effective showing that they're safe making sure you can make them and you get the regulatory approval so that then you can start to dose. So um, the, the concepts and the activities are, are the same um, as, as with vaccines. Um, but the reason why I think a biotech mindset and a VC mindset is helpful is, uh, first of all, my experience is we invest our own money. So every cent of my investors' money uh, includes my own money. And so that means we're very focused on not funding stuff if we don't think it's going to succeed. We're very focused on making sure things do succeed. And we're very focused on doing things quickly. And um, because I've been in the industry for a long time, obviously I've got a, a very broad network of, of people um, across pharma and, and biotech. So that meant it was very easy for, for me and the team to be able to pick up the phone and speak to people. But okay. if, are there other people better qualified? I'm sure there would be. Okay, so which, which then, I mean, you got a call from the Prime Minister. Um, it, you know, we know in a pandemic you can't go through a full recruitment process, but do you think that you'd have been saved a lot of pain if there'd been some discussion with other people? And do you know if there was discussion with other people about taking up the role? Well, remember, I was on the vaccine expert advisory group first, so that wasn't an appointment process either. So uh, I'd attended all those meetings for probably four to six weeks before, since it was first launched. So I imagine, and I'm, I'm not privy to whatever process took place, um, but I imagine there was a discussion uh, that looked at initially the, people, the members on the vaccine ad expert advisory group, because they're the people who had been most exposed to what the government was doing and what the government was seeking to do. Um, and maybe because I'm B, I was early on in the list. I don't know. But um, I, I don't know what the process was. I just know that I received the call and I made the point that I'm not a vaccine expert. Uh, but in hindsight, I think um, I do have some of the skills that have been helpful. Ms. Mumby, were you at all involved in the appointment and, and the, looking at the people, the expertise around? And, and how did you decide who would go uh, onto the original vaccines body um, before the task force was set up? I wasn't privy to this specific uh, appointment, although I would very much agree uh, with Kate that I think uh, uh, in hindsight it's turned out to be a, a rather good one in terms of efficacy of the um, of the task force operation. And we, I think, owe uh, big thanks to Kate uh, alongside all of the other members of the Vaccines Task Force for everything that they've done. Um, the the uh, external advisory board, which was appointed before the creation of the Vaccines Task Force and the appointment of the DG yep. and so on, um, was appointed in consultation with Patrick Valance um, and uh, the names of who's on that uh, group are public. Uh, you can look at them yourself. You'll yep. see a broad range of different representation from business, um, academia um, and others. OK, so but I mean, it's just we know that there's a sort of group. There's names that get floated around in Whitehall appointments. I mean, I've been involved in appointments in one way or another for nearly 25 years, and the same few people come up again. That might not always be a bad thing because sometimes people are very expert, but it can mean that other people get cut out. I think we'll we'll leave that bit there for now. But but I think I mean in terms of um, your uh, what you've learned from this, Ms. Bingham, would you do it again? Uh, yeah. I mean, we've, I would absolutely do it again because I think we've been incredibly successful and we've actually been able to deliver the three objectives that the PM set. So secure vaccines for the UK, yep. secure vaccines internationally and put in place plans to make sure that the UK is better set up for the next pandemic of which there will be another pandemic and more so um, than we are now. So I'm, I'm very happy with what we've done. And yes, I would, even knowing what I know now, I would still do it again. And did you um, think there were any conflicts of interest? Did, how did you handle that when you were first appointed? Did it cross your mind that this might be an issue? Well, I'm, remember, I'm, I'm regulated by the FCA, so I'm highly attuned to conflicts of interest. And just to give you an example, any company with whom we've had a discussion 
uh, at the vaccine task force immediately goes on to my restricted list at SV. So uh, I'm not um, naive when it comes to understanding conflict. Having said that, I do not invest in prophylactic um, infectious disease vaccines. It's just not a not been a historic area of focus of, of our funds, uh, nor is it likely to be in the future. So albeit, albeit companies, for example, like Johnson & Johnson and Janssen are big vaccine providers, they're also big pharmaceutical companies. So the fact that I have relationships there has been helpful for the vaccines, but it's not something that relates to my underlying work as a venture capital investor. Okay, so, so you said it's not likely that the SV Health is going to invest in any of these. Are you there's a little equivocation there. Are you ruling out that you'd invest in vaccines in future, having gone through this process? Um, uh, or are you saying that you you, you might? No, so the, the prophylactic vaccines for infectious diseases is not something that we uh, will invest in. The ambiguity comes where you've got companies that have uh, 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 drug discovery platforms that could be applied, um, such as Moderna. So Moderna, I mean, if we're not an investor in Moderna, we're not going to be investors in Moderna, but that or, or BioNTech, those are companies that have had their platforms validated, their mRNA platforms validated through the COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Their business models, if you went back a year ago, had nothing to do with uh, pandemic vaccines. It was to do with treatment of cancer or treatment of other infectious diseases. So the ambiguity in the future is, is just going to be companies where their platforms could be uh, applied in the future to pandemics. So it, it's, it's not quite as, you know, you're either in this box or you're on, in that box. And that's so as part of my disclosure, um, um, we've gone through every single company that I personally or even SV funds have invested in. And the schedules include every single company, description of the company, whether or not there's any risk of uh, potential uh, conflict and where there's anything that looks uh, uh, concerning, then there was a discussion and, and about what mitigations, if any, could be could be put in place. I might just come in here. Uh, as, as it were, sort of the decision maker on um, on what we've asked um, Kate to do to manage her conflicts of interest, just to in endorse um, what she said, which is that you know 98 or 99 percent of um, uh, Kate's normal activities have got nothing to do with anything that the um, that the VTF does, and you know genuinely no risk of conflict quite apart from any actual conflict. Um, we identified a, a very small number of specific. Um, portfolio companies where there was the possible risk of a future conflict um, and we asked Kate to um, remove herself from any involvement with those specific portfolio companies but I would just emphasize that that was a very very small part um, of Kate's overall um, uh, private sector role and I think we've we've managed um, any any risk very carefully indeed. And just to be clear those are not to do with vaccines those were to do with um, pr passive um, antibody approaches or, or therapeutic approaches. So, so the area where there's the grey area is is the the passive prophylaxis. So for patients who are immunosuppressed, um, whereby if you give them a vaccine, they don't have an immune system to be able to respond to a vaccine. Those individuals could be could receive uh, prophylactic antibody cocktails. They can also use those antibody cocktails for treatment. Um, so basically any company that has an ability to do antibody drug discovery or platform based discovery to provide that same passive prophylaxis, again, theoretically um, could could fall into the vaccines. Now, they're not vaccines, but they could be treat, could be used to treat those um, uh, immunocompromised people. So that's the area that, that we mostly focused on because vaccines per se, as I said, we don't invest in. So there was no there's no disclosure per se on on vaccines. Okay, can I just ask them briefly to Ms Mumby and Ms Bingham before I go back to uh, Sir Geoffrey. Um, Ms Mumby, you know, this is a, an interesting approach. It's, 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 there's a natural defensiveness, I think, in the system against bringing in people from outside Whitehall. That's both perhaps from the political as well as the Whitehall side. Do you think you've learned any lessons here about how to use this sort of task force? And is there anything you'd do, do differently or would, do you think you could deploy this in other areas of Whitehall? Well, I might start by slightly challenging uh, the idea that we don't bring people in from outside Whitehall. Um, my lights are switching off. Yeah. <laughs> we, we bring in people from outside Whitehall all the time. Indeed, uh, I myself um, uh, have been much longer in the private sector than in Whitehall. Um, Nick, too. Uh, we could name. Okay, I was all putting your hands up. 
But so a lot of people don't survive. Ms. Mumby, a lot of, lot of certainly uh, permanent secretaries don't survive very long when they come from outside the system. I'll leave. I won't. Let's not get into that. Thanks for that encouragement. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll aim. I'll aim to buck the trend. Um, but just sort of putting that um, aside, this has been a different model. What's worked really well? Uh, I think the first thing that's worked really well is um, just focus and commitment from a, um, a senior and a diverse group bringing in lots of skills with kind of one job to do well. Uh, you know, we know from any organization that when you have that set up, you're more effective. It's worth saying we can't just replicate that across everything that we do because not everything we do can be the number one, you know, nationwide priority all at the same time. Um, but where we have that, bringing in a focused group, bringing in um, Nick to lead it, for example, as a dedicated DG, I think that worked really well. The Is there anything you, you think that should be done about the way that the roles like that are recruited to? I mean, obviously this was an emergency, but that doesn't mean that necessarily you should let down every guard about going through some sort of a pr process to prove the fairness in a recruitment process. Clearly, if you were in a slower emergency, if that makes sense, you know, there are, there are slower burn, but still critical issues, then you would expect to go through a normal recruitment process. I think this was unusual in the, the combination of the pace and the seriousness. Um, but I did also want to pick out a second uh, point that I think um, worked particularly well, um, which is Kate talked about speed and the need to act quickly in all of this. And um, you can perceive sometimes a trade-off between speed and governance and control. And I think what we did really well specifically on the VTF was accelerating our governance processes so that we could make decisions quickly, but in a well-governed way. So for example, having the sign-offs on the um, vaccine contracts being done by the ministerial panel that brought together the relevant ministers into one room to make a decision. That's a good example of, you know, good governance combined with, with pace. And I think there is something for us to um, think about how do we do that more in the things where speed matters. Huh. Well, uh, I think it's worth having a really good thing. Ms. Bingham, yeah, what, have you, what, have you, what do you take away from this? What do you think, having got had your foray into Whitehall, what, what do you think the Whitehall's got to learn from this process? So the, the first point you made in your previous question was the same old names get um, uh, suggested for roles. Uh, I'm not a same old name. I have no political experience. And I think part of the reason we've been able to be effective is precisely because I don't know what the boundaries are. So I'm sure I've um, trod, trod on all sorts of people's toes because I've wanted to get on with doing the job, which was to get vaccines as soon as possible. And so I think if I had been a Whitehall groupie, which is, I'm not sure if that was your suggestion, but I am certainly not a Whitehall groupie. <laughs> Um, uh, it's it's because I don't because I don't know the rules and because um, I just I just get on with what I've been asked to do. So in terms of lessons, I think the key lessons actually are the political ones. I wouldn't change anything that we did in terms of um, the work we did on securing the vaccines, the work we've done on supporting the rapid development of those vaccines. So the NHS registry, the human challenge, the standardised assays, and now emerging, we'll start doing the heterologous boost assays. And I wouldn't change anything that we've done in terms of the preparation and support for the UK manufacturing uh, industry, because I think there's huge scope both uh, for pandemic preparedness, but also economic growth. So these are things that I um, am very proud of. I think the team has been phenomenal. Nick and the group um, of our, our steering committee have brought skills um, of um, that's come through defence procurement, from manufacturing, through delivery, uh, clinical, regulatory, um, and so on, and international, actually, that have been really spectacular. So that, I think, has worked incredibly well. The areas which I think we've fallen down on have been the political um, savvy and the, the fact that there have been um, challenges which seem to be politically motivated, um, suggesting that exactly the line of questioning that you're going after, which is, um, have you got the job because of, of who you're related to or who you know, rather than whether or not you're competent. And I just don't think uh, we handled that particularly well. And so if I was had my time again, I would be more uh, insistent that we did cross party briefings uh, because those didn't happen, and that anybody who wanted to know what it was we were doing or how we were doing it or wanted to kick the tires uh, within within uh, Westminster should should be free to do so. 
and that we should, as the vaccine task force, should be free to respond. So our ability to communicate is still within the sort of Bayes have to approve, number 10 has to approve. And by the time things happen, these are not political communications by and large. We're talking about vaccines which don't respond to but you know, political It's interesting you borders. use the phrase though, politically motivated because I think it's a question that lots of people have. Uh, you raise it, you know, you're, you're married to somebody who is you know, close to the prime minister, who is a minister indeed. People will ask that question. Did that not occur to you when you, you picked up the phone, took the job offer? But that you might get criticised for that connection, despite your own professional background. Of course, um, of course, we understood that. But I would challenge you to go around the Treasury and ask how many people before I was appointed would even be able to tell uh, you um, the name of, of my husband's uh, uh, name me as being married to Jesse. It's just I'm not I'm not in the political set, and I don't spend any time doing it. So I think it's high, people in my sector know exactly who I am. But people in, in politics are don't. And so, of course, I accept that there will be questions. But um, I think you have to look at the track record and my background and the fact that uh, I was on the Vaccine Expert Advisory Group beforehand. I'm on the Life Science Industrial Strategy uh, Government Advisory Group as well. Uh, the, through British Patient Capital, you've actually invested in two of my funds and named me as a key person. So I'm not unknown to government, but I'm not, in the, I'm not a, um, a political person in any way or form. Can I just ask though, have you had you met the Prime Minister before before you took on the role? Yes, we are uh, direct contemporaries at Oxford. Right. Or maybe so, I was a year above or below. Okay. I'm, I'm, so, anyway, close enough. So I think no one can doubt from what you've told us today about and uh, your expertise and and what the achievement is. But I think you, it's a fair question. You have been at university with the Prime Minister, uh, and we know those networks, you know, do mean that people make phone calls to people they know sometimes. So there, the, the, I think that yeah, it's a fair fair question that people have asked I don't think it's something to be defensive about but I think you've made a, a good fist of, of arguing your your point on that but uh, there is a danger that this prime minister has sometimes made calls to people who knows all prime ministers have a tendency potentially to do that so we just need to, we need to question and it is right that we do that on behalf of the taxpayer because ultimately you were uh, the, ultimately Ms Mumby was, was responsible but you were effectively spending taxpayers money so it's important we ask those questions just Ms. to be Mumby. clear I'm not spending taxpayer money I'm doing, organising the work to make recommendations for the ministers uh, right. to make the decisions. And remember, I'm unpaid. Yes, yeah. Well, I think, but being unpaid, you're still accountable for the decisions and actions you've taken. I think you'd agree that. I'm accountable for the strategy and the work we've taken, yes. And then the actual decisions on procurement are made either by the ministers or by... Um, we, we, could, we could go down that squirrel hole on this committee about who's responsible for what in Whitehall, because we often have that discussion about ministers and who actually makes decisions. But uh, thank you for, for that, Ms Bingham. Ms Mumby, you wanted to come back in, and I'm going to go to Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown. So Ms Mumby. No, uh, uh, only to say that, uh, that ultimately, I, I think it's important for the record to say that, you know, Kate received the call and she answered it um, and came and did good work. Uh, and the question of, you know, whether she should or shouldn't have been called, uh, which I think we've discussed now, um, is not for her to answer. Well, I think she's managed to answer very well for herself, if I may say, Ms Mumby. Uh, thank you, Ms Mumby and Ms Bingham. Back to Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown. Um, we've had a long um, session on this very, very important subject. Just a very few questions just to, to, to wrap up. Firstly, to Dr Lawson. Um, it appears in behavioural terms that the younger groups are not adhering to the guidance as much as the older groups. It looks as though the take up of the vaccine is going to be quite high by the older groups, but we know that those are under 65 in the flu vaccine was only 45%. Are you worried that the take up uh, as we get down the priority groups will decline and what action are you going to take to prevent that? So I should say, first of all, that there is a cross government um, communications team, which includes those from the vaccines task force and the cabinet office, for example, led by um, the DHSC that's looking at all of the issues of communication around vaccines. So, I mean, I'm happy to give a view, but it, it, it may be that we want to um, we want to ask the question um, more broadly as well. So the, the polling that was referenced earlier has shown the UK has one of the highest, if not the highest um, openness to vaccines of, of any country in the Western world, with 82% of people saying in a survey last week that they would either consider or strongly um, rush towards getting a vaccine. So we start in an incredibly powerful position. Um, as you say, um, that's higher, highest um, in the older age groups, but one of the ways to increase vaccine confidence and vaccine uptake um, is for people to see their, you know, their grandparents, their teachers, their uncles and aunts, et cetera, um, getting the vaccine and for that to start making a change in, in how we're all able to live. So we think the best 
um, strategy is to do this and do it really well and do it safely and make sure that the the whole um, atmosphere around the program is one of an effective mass vaccination program that really changes um, how the country is able to operate. So that's what we're that's what we're focused on. And JCVI published some very helpful guidance about what it takes to run a successful uh, mass vaccination program, which includes that sort of operational delivery angle, as well as very straightforward um, cohorting and, and openness to take the vaccine. So that's the guidelines that we're, that we're following collectively across the program. Thank you very much. Next question to Nick Elliott. Um, this RNA technology for vaccines is entirely novel. Um, is it um, only suitable for SARS type viruses or could it be replicated to deal with other, a wide range of different viruses? So I might pass that one on to Kate anyway, but my understanding is it could be used for a wide range of different uh, viruses. So it provides us with lots of flexibility for the future. It's a quite exciting you know, sort of new development in, uh, in the response to these types of challenges. Kate, do you want to say anything further? Yeah. So what it is, is basically a piece of genetic material that allows the cells to then translate those into proteins. So basically make a bit of viral protein, which then is recognized by the immune system and generates that immune response. So it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, it, you, can, you could deliver any, any form of um, genetic material in this format. Um, so yes, it's suitable for viruses, but it's also suitable for cancer. I mean, it's also suitable for anything where you want to stimulate an immune response. Um, against a specific uh, protein. So in your political thinking with Nick Robinson last week, you talked about the UK needing to um, scale up a, a, a bulk antibody manufacturer. How is uh, your work on the task force leading to that possibility? So we've started a market engagement um, process uh, when I was still there. Um, and I don't know where, where that's got to now, but but what, what was set out was um, a uh, discussion with industry to say what are the options for the for the government to work with industry to create that bulk antibody supply it's not just for prophylactic treatment for um for, for immunosuppressed people it could also be used for therapeutics and bio biotherapeutics or basically biologicals as as drugs are becoming an increasingly important part of um treatment in in medicine today so that i don't know nick or sarah if you can update where we've got to but the market engagement started in november so perhaps when when either you or they answer this question is this the real bonus uh, uh, that we might get from this whole unfortunate covid episode by setting up this whole new industry for sure and that's why it's so exciting because we're the only country in the world western country in the world to show that you can we can take academic science and turn that into a commercially industrial consistent approved vaccine and so to go from the academic to launch in in less than a year is phenomenal so we've got the we've got the underlying science and we've got all the different bits so that we can make the vaccines whether it's it's viral and well viral mrna um, protein whole virus plus then antibodies and and we've got the process the, the, the groups the state funded groups like cpi so center of process innovation up in darlington that has those additional capabilities that can su support the supply chain and then if you combine that with the capabilities we've got in the uk UK through the NIHR that we've got national uh, clinical trial networks again the fact that we've got every single person's got an NHS number and we're able to bring people into trials like we have again sets us apart from the other countries and the final bit is on genomics so the UK has sequenced more of the strains of COVID than any other country all the other countries put together so in terms of what we, the UK, have been able to pull together, lots of that is existing fund, government funded institutional um, activity, but it's just very exciting. And th the idea that we can come out of this more strongly than we went in is absolutely something we should be shooting for. And we need to make sure that next time a pandemic comes along, we just treat this like a, just another flu, flu jab because we've got all the bits in place. Everybody's talking to each other and it, and it works well. And I think it really will um, set us up um, incredibly well. And what the one bit I haven't mentioned is obviously the MHRA and their, uh, the fact that they've shown their nimbleness and cooperative um, working with the different vaccine companies and then pharmacovigilance. So that is basically assessing the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines once they've been deployed. And that is fundamental to public trust in vaccines. And it really matters that we both do this properly, but that we actually manage in the future um, 
the analysis of how the vaccines perform because it'll both affect what future vaccines we want to give as well as understand what are the best regimes and how do we do it and how can we best protect the population and that will be relevant for every country around the world and again there are very few countries anywhere that have that same capability as we do in the UK. Okay, Ms. Bingham, you. Ms. Bingham, I'm going to leave it there, but I've done hundreds, probably thousands of these PAC inquiries. And can I just say a big congratulations to you and the whole of Bayes and the NHS for putting the UK in the world lead in this field and finding a probable solution to this dreadful uh, period, this COVID virus that we've been through. Many congratulations and thanks to all of you. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey. And I think we all echo that. Dame Cheryl. Yes, I'm, I'm, I echo that uh, entirely. Um, one of my colleagues um, in our back chat has asked um, uh, how we deal with uh, the, the, the messages that come from frontline staff who hear people saying, I'm waiting for the British vaccine. Um, I, I don't know whether anybody's got a comment to make on that, um, but I think we need to significantly communicate that there is so much British uh, invention and science in this that we should be rightly proud of it. And uh, I echo everything Sir Jeffrey Clifton Brown said. This is a pandemic. Uh, this is international. This knows absolutely no boundaries, sadly. And um, uh, for once, the UK um, has actually done the procurement of the um, vaccine doses on behalf of the devolved nations, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland and Wales. And of course, although this is an English select committee, we are missing a very vital piece of information. And I'd wondered whether the permanent secretary, whether Sir Chris could actually provide us with the same figures on the devolved administrations on Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland that we've had today. Um, I'd like to know how many doses of vaccine they've received. And I'd like to know how many as of today that they have delivered to their population and how they're doing on their targets. I think if we narrow ourselves down to this uh, little English England vision, we're making a big mistake. We are a United Kingdom and this virus is going across all borders and it was the United Kingdom government that made the procurement. Uh, I wondered if Sir Chris could comment on that. Um, I, don't, I don't have those numbers uh, with me, but I'm quite happy to work with my uh, devolved colleagues uh, to uh, uh, provide them to the committee. Um, so the way this works um, is the vaccine task force and Bayes side of the house is, as you say, UK wide. Uh, to, um, and um, and then the delivery um, is um, with the four jurisdictions um, and the four NHSs. Uh, that said, um, we have worked very, very closely with our devolved uh, colleagues uh, on a whole range uh, of issues. Uh, the four CMOs group, which has been a uh, very, very powerful uh, and successful uh, group uh, during the pandemic discusses this uh, all the time. We discuss it on the administrative side, the four NHSs uh, uh, discuss it, uh, both to keep uh, what we are doing aligned and for the obvious cross-border issues of people don't live neatly uh, in, the four, uh, uh, in the four jurisdictions. Um, and again, uh, this has been one of the, uh, uh, the, the, the most, I mean, there have been several in the pandemic, but this has been one of the most successful uh, areas of uh, where we have cooperated across the four jurisdictions uh, with a, as you say, very clear UK role um, and then um, uh, to some very effective uh, working at the four jurisdiction uh, uh, level as well, which is as it should be. Uh, maybe just to add one very simple point, which is probably clear to everybody, um, but where we've been purchasing on behalf of all of the nations, um, the doses are split by population, so everybody gets the the kind of the right share throughout. There's no um, there's no challenge around needing to you know choose or prioritise. Um, it's going proportionally, um, not just to the four nations, but to overseas territories as well. No, I think I mean Scotland's getting eight point two percent based on population, as I understand it. But I think what is important is we also need to know about the efficacy of delivery as well, because otherwise we don't have that holistic um, picture. And because it's been a UK wide procurement, we need to be able to reflect how well that UK wide cooperation uh, is going and how we have been uh, able to, to, to bring the four nations together um, during this terrible period of time. Oh, ch Chair, if it's uh, helpful, I could just come in. I, I think I'm right in saying that the Scottish uh, government have published their figures for uh, yes for cumulative uh, today. I think their numbers are 163,377 
doses administered in Scotland. Um, and I think the, the number in Wales may be 86,118. Thank you very much. If we could just confirm those, and uh, and I think to have a running total of those again on communication will um, give us a much better picture across the the whole of the United Kingdom. And, and Sir Simon, as you're on microphone, could you pick up the point Miss Blake raised? Um, we're now picking up that other people have been saying there's this this line about I want the British one, or I haven't got the one I want. It seems to be running a little bit. Is, is that, I don't know if you or, or Dr. Lawson can give us any comfort on how you're going to communicate with people that the, that the vaccine's the vaccine. It doesn't matter which one you get. Yeah, the chief medical officers have all been very clear that uh, both vaccines are excellent and each of them provides a fantastically improved protection over not having them and therefore please just come forward and accept the one that you're offered. Great, well thank you for that. I think that's probably all you can say at this point but it's certainly something to watch for. Sir Geoffrey, did you want to come in one last moment of time? No, no, I'm fine. I'm finished, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, and thank you to the committee and thank you very much indeed to our witnesses. Uh, a lot of you, but um, uh, as Sir Geoffrey said, uh, pulled together in extraordinary times to achieve extraordinary things. And I think there are big lessons here, which we will hope to tease out in our report about how well this has gone, but particularly the lessons for going forward um, as we're likely to face uh, future challenges uh, in future. So I can say, I could say to the witnesses that the Zoom call will end formally, but you will still be online for a little, little longer after I declare the meeting over. Order, order. <laughs>